Hey everyone, you're watching Conversations in Pop Culture and I'm your host, Andrew Davis, and this episode is brought to you by my sponsor, my very own t-shirt, which is this sweet Gundam t-shirt that I have <laughs> made. So go buy it. It's making fun of Taco Bell, Amaro Ray, Londo Bell, the most interesting man in the world, Fallout, and anything else you could potentially think of making fun of. It is available in 16 different colors and it is a great way how to support this show because all the proceeds from this t-shirt are actually going to make in this show work. So please, if you're a fan of Gundam, you're a fan of humor, you're a fan of funny things that are not ultra offensive, that's the shirt you should buy. Um, and I'm not going to bore everybody else with the rest of my sponsors because I have with me professional wrestler and voice actor Eric Kimmerer. And you voice pretty much everything in the entire <laughs> anime world. No, 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 I'm joking, I'm joking, joking. Um, he's voiced Biscuit Griffin from Mobile Suit Gundam. IBO. He's voiced Ali Baba from Magi. He's voiced, voiced the bow hero from Rise of the Shield hero and several others. So welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no, I, I am very excited because I love a bunch of stuff. I loved IBO. I love Rise of the Shield hero. I love a bunch of stuff that you've been in and you've been doing this for about 12 years, I want to say around that number. And he yeah, that's about that's accurate actually. <laughs> I hadn't actually counted out myself yet, but oof. And, and so and so I'm very curious how you got into voice acting because you're not Gen One, which is all like the nineties guys and going into the two thousands, and you're sort of gen two and gen three voice acting, I feel a little bit. Yeah, I'm kind of the crossover of gen two, gen three, I guess you would call it. I haven't not, I haven't considered it that way, but um Essentially, I got started. I'm from Seattle. I'm from Washington State. And up there when I was in high school, I got a newsletter from a local convention, um, SakuraCon, still going strong, probably the biggest Pacific Northwest convention for anime there is. And they had in their newsletter on the off season just kind of a bulletin board. And I caught an advertisement for a veteran Japanese voice actress, Run Sasaki, who had moved to Seattle and was looking to teach people anime voice acting and never even considered acting as a career at that point. I took a couple of electives of play production in high school just to get the art credit out of the way. I fell in love with it and stuck with it throughout and inevitably majored in theater arts. <laughs> so the acting bug bit, as they said. Um, but yeah, she taught us the, the Japanese way of dubbing anime, which is actually different to the American way of dubbing anime, but more akin to the American way of recording uh, pre-lay cartoons, Cartoon Network shows and, and Nickelodeon shows. So I, it was really cool to be able to do that and, and learn from somebody who had been doing it for 20 years. She had been in Macross and, and Alvin Joe and all, the, all these really cool AD shows. So we got to learn directly from her and then after graduating college, I knew that I, by then, throughout high school and college, I had been taking these classes and knew this is what I wanted to do. So like I said, graduated with a theater arts degree and moved instantly down to California. In the summer after my graduation, I came down to Anime Expo and participated in the uh, AX Idol competition that was sponsored by Bang Zoom, where they had a voiceover and singing competition side by side. And I had competed it a few years before, uh, got into the finals in 2008, competed in 2000, no, got into the final, yeah. 2008, I got into the finals. I competed in 2007, and then 2010, I actually won the competition and moved down and got a, a, a shot to start with Bang Zoom out of that. Yeah, so to even talk about that, because obviously there's been a few other people who have come out of that, Kira Buckland, has definitely come mm -hmm. out of that competition and yep. a few others. And it really is, I think the year, the year she won actually was the first year I competed. <laughs> I mean, I mean, she, she's beyond talented. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, uh, I, and I love every voice that she's in and I think she does. Um, and she was on my other show. Um, the, the predecessor to this one, which is fusing together soon guys, <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, in the next 18 months, there's going to be a fusion between the two shows. And then it's going to form a new uh, Super Saiyan, but that's not the point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, all jokes aside, what was this like coming in? Because this was really a propeller in a lot of ways. When you win this competition and then you sort of get attention driven to you. And then I don't want to say you get a golden ticket, 
but you do get sort of a step up a little bit, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah, you get a foot in the door and it's up to you to bring your best and show up for the opportunity you're being given. So, um, you know, the prize was a tour of Bang Zoom um, and a, uh, a couple of classes with them under there. And I had already actually paid for the classes before I won them because they came up to Seattle at one point and I was really interested in learning from Tony, Tony Oliver. And he's just been a great guy ever since. It's always always knowledgeable, always helpful. Um, but yeah, it gets you a class, it gets you a tour of the studio. Um, but Bang Zoom had known of me prior to that. So this was just kind of the solidifier. They remembered me from previous competitions from being in the finals and, and even remembered my audition from the one I didn't get in. So they, they recognize, you know, people who are passionate about this and returning and trying again and again and you know, really wanted to be a part of this. And they're very nurturing about that. So I was I was very fortunate to be able to be a part of that competition and get my start just through that, just getting a couple of roles from Bang Zoom afterwards, which, uh, you know, forgive the pun, accelerated to one of my first big roles in Excel World. Yes, yes, yes. And, and some of those early roles, just so everybody knows, it was in key. No, no. <laughs> There were some really yeah. interesting early roles. There was I was like Hamaguchi in Mahoromatic OVA. I was I think I uh, was voice matching for Dave Wittenberg on that one because he wasn't returning. Um, and then I did one of my only villains I've ever done, Inugami and Nura: Rise of the Yokai Clan. And that was with Tony, and I got to be really all out on that one. He's still in a coma. He's still in a coma. I have to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as, far as we know. <laughs> um, but my first actual on-air role, I don't even think it's credited, but I actually, before winning the competition, I was friends with Kira Buckland, so I came down to visit her every so often. And one summertime, I came down to really kind of scout the area right before I was planning on moving down here, just get a lay of the land. And Bang Zoom actually brought me in without competition credentials or anything, let me tour the studio, and then they threw me in for some walla on Mori Bito, which I can't remember the full title of it, but it was on Adult Swim. So I was in the background in this one scene, and that's actually my first official on, you know, in the can voiceover line. That's, that's, I got to find that's somewhere. crazy. And then obviously they, there's just some weird roles. Yeah, like like a throwaway role in SAO, as I think Ducker as well. And, you know, it's just like... I wouldn't call him throwaway. I would actually say he's very pivotal in starting the whole PTSD train that Kitty uh, that uh, Kitty Toe is on. He's pretty pivotal in in giving Kitty Toe PTSD that lasts throughout the show. So yes, <laughs> I wouldn't say throwaway. Although because so, so of you're, that, you're, you're the fault of of Kirito. So, so, so yeah, you're yeah. Just giving Kirito an excuse here. Yeah, but that being said, whenever I'm playing a. Uh, MMOs or tabletop games, my friends never let me play the rogue because of that scene. They never, they, they don't want me to ducker it. And so, so obviously, I mean, I'm a huge SAO fan. I love SAO. I love everything about the concept of SAO. I think, I think it really is a beautiful, beautiful series. And I, and I think it, it follows very well as a sequel to Dot Hack. Um, but, but I, I'm, I'm an anime weeboo and we, we don't have to get too deep into the history of anime. <laughs> Um, that, that that's a different show that I do not run. Um, so, so, so if somebody else does a great job with, with that show is all I'm going to say. But I do want to talk about Excel World because that's kind of your first major lead. And I think that's the role that really started putting you on the map. And I'm going to get his name wrong and I'm going to try. I think it's Haruyuki Arita, I want to say. And yep. Silver Crow guys. And... Uh, I have pictures. I have pictures. So, so this will help. I got oh, yeah. <laughs> this guy. This guy. Right? I got that, that too. Yeah, that's his. Uh, that's his video game avatar. I've got like three plushies of that right now, actually. So, how, how did this come about? Because obviously, you're really new into the entire anime world, and this is a big show. Obviously, yeah. it's a lead. It has somewhat of a following, and it's kind of a big deal. And there are people who sort of work their ass off for years and don't get a lead role till till five, six, seven years in, in the game. And here you are sort of, I don't want to say hop, jump, and a skip, 
but you're now in a very interesting spotlight position. It was a very interesting spotlight position, yeah, um, because I was only doing just these episodic one-shot characters. I'd, I hadn't even done a character I don't think lasted an entire show. Longest that was lasted was Inugami for a few episodes. So um, I actually auditioned initially for the friend character. God, it's been so long since I've watched it. I can't even remember their names. Um, the character I'm, that not never... I'm in the middle. Yeah, of it, so. yeah. <laughs> I initially auditioned for the character that Lucian Dodge got. Um, and put in the audition and thought it was fine. And they got back to me, Bang Zoom got back to me a couple of days later saying, hey, you know, actually, we also want to hear you read for this character. And we want you to actually come into the studio to read for it. So they had me, this was my first time going into studio for audition. They had me in for Haruyuki. Um, and I remember, interesting story about that, I pulled into the parking lot of Bang Zoom Studios and right next to the general reserved for talent, there was a res reservation next to it saying reserved for C. O'Brien. I'm like, C. O'Brien? Who could that be? I've never heard of you know, that voice actor in this industry or before. Sure enough, I walk into the lobby and Conan O'Brien walks <laughs> out <laughs> with a... <laughs> Like they were doing some sort of uh, bit that inevitably aired on Conan O'Brien, where they went into the studio and were kind of joke recording, joke dubbing. And one of the scenes they recorded was from a show called Return of the Pearl Princess, a live action Chinese show that we dubbed and that I was in. So it was this weird kind of like, OK, welcome to Hollywood, I guess. <laughs> but yeah, so I auditioned sweet. for that and then got it later. Um, and my roommate, Sarah, got Nico. Um, and she's still my roommate. She was my roommate back then. She's still my roommate to this day. So it was our first time getting to work together. And that was just so much fun. Yeah. And, and then even going further into this, because obviously now you're doing this, obviously you have, and, and in voice acting, and I think at the time, you don't really know how long a series is going to last. It could last 12 episodes. It could last 24 episodes. But obviously, what was this like? Because you know, he has a very interesting arc where he goes from being, you know, a low self-esteem fat kid for, for lack of a better word. And I know it's not politically correct, everybody, you know, you know, you know, but and he kind of comes into the idea of being a badass to some degree in both the real world and in the video game in a lot of ways. And so what was this like? Because he has a very interesting character arc and yeah. It's such a cool story because it's kind of nice and people can actually resonate with this character in a lot of ways, too. I was excited for the most part because, um, you know, one of my favorite books of all time is uh, The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell, kind of outlining the monomyth that we we all know through uh, Simba, Luke Skywalker, Hercules. They all follow the same beats of getting the mythical weapon, being trained by the older person. So there's this hero's journey that that is prevalent throughout and, and Hero with a Thousand Faces really lays it out. So to see Hadayuki, I knew that this was what it was going to be. It was going to be the hero's journey, the call to action, refusal of the call, the crossing of the first threshold, the mythical weapon. Um, I was I was ecstatic to be able to present this story finally, like have, have a chance to do it. And it was, it, we looked at Hadayuki, the director and I, and he was, he's very wimpy to begin with. I mean, I'm not gonna mince words. He is, he is, uh, he's a wimp. Um, so we wanted it to be at least endearing in a way, and we didn't want it to be off-putting and just like overly whiny. And sure enough, when I, when the first few episodes came out, they aired on this streaming service that no longer exists called Neon Alley. And, uh, that's where they first, the dubs first aired. And the reaction was good. You know, people liked the dub, but I heard a lot of people saying, oh, he's too whiny. He sounds just like Shinji from Neon Genesis Evangelion. <laughs> and, and even some people on Tumblr were like, oh, Eric Kimmerer, nice job, Spike Spencer. We know that's you using a pseudonym because I wasn't even known at that point. So <laughs> they thought it was actually Shinji voicing another really wimpy character. <laughs> So, so, so to even go into that, too, because obviously, I mean, he, he has 
you know, Haruki has a very, very interesting character development arc where Mm -hmm. he kind of does sound whiny. He has low self-confidence. But as you get into episodes five, six, seven, eight, and even going further and towards the end of the entire series, you know, he's now having more self-confidence. His avatar is obviously gaining more power. He's making more decisions. He's sort of gaining respect of a lot of people. And what is that like? Because not every character gets that in anime. And obviously, you know, it's kind of a cool thing. And I felt that you sort of got to take the car out into, you know, third and fourth gear a little bit. And you laugh about it, but it's kind of true, I think. Oh, like, like, no, I mean, it, it not just third and fourth gear, but like fifth gear. Because I remember as Hadayuki, I had to drop an F-bomb sometime later on. He was going <laughs> completely berserk. So <laughs> the gears shifted heavily with him. Um and like I said, we knew we wanted to start him Wimpy, but we didn't want him. We knew we wanted to go on this journey with him and this arc of him gaining more confidence. And the thing is, is that he's not a sad, you know, like a co- completely hopeless case. He's got his confidence in his video games. He's got his worlds that he retreats to where he is much more confident in. And when he's able to merge that, like find a community that allows him to have both, that's where he starts coming into his own. It's it's really fun. and And I really kind of dig this as I, I say the show is not many people say it this way. It's a Sentai show. It's, it's the different colors and the uh, different powers and, and like the transformations and everything. I see this as kind of a digital power Rangers kind of thing going on. So I, I viewed it very differently where I viewed it as a Shonen that became a Sarin Sarin where it, it, it started to yeah. start as a Shonen. And then it became very adult and slowly became adult and sort of aged into, I felt, a little bit of an older age. And as you go through it, and that's kind of, I mean, look, I'm in the middle of the show, so I'm on episode eight. So I'm not saying how I know exactly how it ends or anything of that nature, but that's what I've sort of got where I feel that from episode three to episode eight, you get that progression. And I just think it's brilliant. And then even going further into this, you have to also do the movie too, which is cool. Mm-hmm. And, and that that's nice as well because the anime has a good ending, but I feel the movie does a really, really good job of adding a little bit more to it. The movie was a really interesting experiment because half of it is recap from the anime and half of it is new material. But even though they recap the anime, they jump ahead in time because I think in the anime we only got through volume four or six of the light novel source material in terms of what was adapted for the first season. And then the movie shows all that in the first half and then jumps to light novel 23 or 24 (laughs) with all these new characters that have been introduced in between. And since we never got a second season, we're just like, who's that? Who's that? And the DVD case even had to come with a, a timeline, like a little insert timeline to tell you what is going on here. And it's kind of cool because obviously the movie came out in 2016. And mm-hmm. so obviously we're talking about three, four years later, which is always nice too. When all it's sudden- nice, but it's it's nerve wracking to go into the booth three years later, three years older and go, can I still do this voice? Because <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then he was really up here. He was really, you know, high pitched and kind of wimpy. And yeah, <laughs> it's, it's one I'm just like, I know I'm not going to be able to do that forever. So get that second then, season out now, guys, please. <laughs> <laughs> and then even going further into your career a little bit, because obviously this wasn't the only thing that was going on. No. Obviously, Toradora was going on around this time, too, as Ryuji. I, I'm going to get the name wrong. Yeah, yeah Ryuji. I, and, I gave uh, up one time. Ago, <laughs> I, gave up. I just gave up. <laughs> well, that was an interesting one, two, three punch for my career, because... Um, It was around the very end of recording for Excel World, I got the audition for Magi. And I got the audition for Alibaba. I actually, yep, there he is. (laughs) And I managed to land the role and I got the email that I was given, given the role on the very last session of Excel World. And it was really weird and serendipitous because Harayuki and Alibaba share the same Japanese voice actor as well, Yuki Kaji. And we made a joke about that, me and the casting director, and then she auto-cast me in another Yuki Kaji role for Blood Lad. 
and then auditioned me for another Yuki Kaji role in One Punch Man and and put me in another Yuki Kaji role. So I've had six of his roles right now as an in-joke between me it, and the casting director. It's funny you mention that because you've been on a bunch of shows that Mario Okada has been running and wrote. And she's mm -hmm. a monster. She's yeah. like a little devil where you either <laughs> love her work or you hate her work. I mean, probably, yeah, it, it, and, and I think you've been on four or five shows that that, that she sort of either ran or she's written the script for, she's the showrunner on. And it's I kind need of to crazy. cross check that. I actually haven't done that research before, um, but that does sound about right. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, when it came to uh, Toradora, that was I auditioned for that right around the same time as Magi, and I remember the casting director before I got the email from Magi even coming up to me and goes. Is your schedule clear? Because you're gonna you're about to be very busy. And I'm just like, oh, I got one of the roles. And when I got both of the roles, I got Ryuji especially. I was like, are you sure you know what you're doing with me? Because um, especially so with Ryuji, I auditioned for for Takasu, and that was the character I thought I was going to get—the nerdy glasses, more higher pitched character. And Ryuji was in Japanese a little bit more deeper than anything I had ever done before. So when they gave it to me, I'm just like. You sent this to the right person, right? But so, so to even talk about that, because Ryuji is a very tempered character. He's, mm -hmm. you know, very calm. He, he's not a pushover, I want to say, but, but, but he, he, he's definitely quieter, I feel. And it, it's also, Toradora is very different than Excel World. And it's very different yes. than Maji, where it's a romantic comedy. It's well done in a lot of ways in, in that regard i thoroughly enjoyed my my run in in, in toradora and watching it because i thought it was well played between obviously the two main characters and I, for for those who don't know they both like two different people and they're trying to help each other out and it's a very classic you know storyline as far as things that have been done and then they sort of fall in love and i think they do wind up getting together at the end from my recollection um but Sorry, spoiler alert in case you, 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 know, you know. Well, if you know you anything about the show, you you know that the spoiler's in the title itself already. So, you know, I'm just saving everybody time here. Oh, um, <laughs> but what was this like? Because all of a sudden you're going from a very action driven, very, you know, high paced, colorful show to a romantic comedy. And then when we go into magic, you're going right back into action. And it's kind of a weird position, I would imagine as an actor where it's like, you're not changing gears, you're changing cars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're going from a motorcycle to a pickup truck. Um, yeah, because I was recording a couple of, I was recording at sometimes both shows simultaneously. And Toradora was very, very different in the sense that it took a lot longer to record for a lot of the more action shows with a lot of more characters in them. You know, you're switching between scenes and, and different groups of characters. It can take probably two to four hours per episode to record for a single person. Uh, for Toradora, we were upwards to four to six hours per episode because it was just dialogue heavy. There wasn't any kind of action to break up the dialogue. And 60%, if not more, probably 75% of the dialogue was shared by the two main characters, me and Cassandra. So we were in the booth for long, long, long periods of time, really honing. And we had, we were able to really kind of hone in on these characters a lot more that way, just kind of talk the decisions out with the director. And because it was kind of a little slower pace trying to really bring this to life. This was Niz's first dub anime. And there was a lot of pressure on that, especially for a show that was out at that point for three years and had a huge fan base. It, at that point, it still had people every year on Reddit doing a rewatch on the uh, Toradora or the anime subreddits. So, so to even talk about that, because I think this is something that certain people understand in the anime community and certain people don't, is that there's a lot of pressure if you're a director, you're a script writer, you're a voice actor, and you know that you could fuck it up. I mean, you've yeah. seen bad dubs, I've seen bad dubs, and it can ruin a show. I mean, I don't know, you know, how extensively you watch anime, but I watch about five to seven hundred episodes of anime a year. And <laughs> and 
I watch a lot of wrestling too. Um, I, I gave up sleep a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but but the, the IWTV is like my favorite thing along with Crunchyroll. Um, but I have actually turned off English dubs and watched the Japanese dub because the English dub was rough. And so I don't know. And I think that's a real issue where an English voice actor can ruin a show very easily. A Japanese voice actor can also ruin a show, yeah. you know, in Japan. And so it, I've watched, I'm in the middle of watching a panty and stocking with garter belt. And I actually don't like the Japanese dub. I think the English dub is better. And I think it's actually more on point and, and more funnier to, to, if that's even a word there. But what is that like for you? Because you don't want to be known as the guy that screwed it up and, I hate to say it, but <laughs> anime fans, we're mean. <laughs> to be very nice, we're mean, and we'll let you know. Yeah, I mean, I just have to have faith in the process and the people that I'm working with because, um, I mean, I can always have a reason for why something was done this way or that way, and I get a lot of... Uh, when I did an AMA a while back, people were asking me about Toradora. Why did they write it to have so many colloquialisms? You know, he's saying like uh, hide much or just a lot of modern day colloquialisms. But um, I didn't see the problem with it myself as an anime fan. I thought it fit perfectly and I always had kind of a reason for it. Um, so it's all subjective. It's, it's, I, uh, I don't. You know, I don't ever want to be the one to ruin a show, so I'm always putting my best foot forward in it. Um, but it is a huge collaborative process, and I think people are kind of aware and wary of the disconnect when it comes to dubbing anime into English as opposed to what they do in Japan, where they have a lot more collaboration. They have table reads. They have the actors working together. So ours is a little more disjointed, but... Um, you know, throughout the times, we've been able to uh, really hone the skills of writing, adapting, and so, and also yeah. open up the communications with the clients uh, that we're licensing the stuff from to be able to get any questions answered. And it's, sometimes I'll have the Japanese clients on Skype in the booth with me. Like, they'll be on a Skype call so they can kind of check us on any questions we have about, well, should this line be said this way? Does this... So did you also feel, though, that maybe in America, and, and, and I mean, you're, you're a wrestling fan, you're a wrestler, obviously a wrestling fan. I think, yeah. I think, I think it's very hard if you're a wrestler not to be a wrestling fan. I, I, I'm sure it can be done. I'm sure it can be We're done. the ultimate marks. We're the ultimate marks. Honestly. So, but, but, but even going into wrestling a little bit, where I think that there is, unless you're in the industry, unless, you know, because obviously I interview a lot of voice actors, I interview a lot of wrestlers, that... I think they're sometimes fans don't understand the business. I think they don't want to take the time to understand the business. And I think it's easy sometimes for people to criticize, say, hey, look, I'm an anime fan, but I don't want to know how an anime dub actually gets done and where it goes from ADR to a script writer to translating it over to what the director knows and all that stuff and actually how the whole process knows. And I think that's also part of the problem sometimes is I've been doing this for over 10 years, interviewing voice actors and a lot of people. So I have a somewhat good idea of what actually takes place inside an anime studio, as yeah. much as I can know as an outsider. Um, but I think somebody who says, hey, look, I just like watching, you know, Toradora. I don't really care how it got dubbed and they hate the dub. You know, I think I think. It, so do you think that's part of the problem? Why, you know, people sometimes are quick to criticize? Um, I think I can be part of the problem. The most common criticism I hear, and I have a hard time arguing against this one, is that when you watch the Japanese uh, subtitled version, you're getting the original, not just the original cast, but like the original intent, the director of the show is there and not uh, by proxy across the seas. Um, everybody is there collaborating on this in the moment all together, and I kind of get that. Um, my answer, you were talking about how, uh, you found the English dub of, of Penny and Stocking to be funnier. And that maybe just because it's, you know, we can get the timing and the humor of it a lot easier when we're hearing it outright. We don't have to read it and then kind of process it. It It's I much also easier that way. With, with, with Penny and Stocking with Garter Bell, I think also the American version is Americanized and it's making fun yeah. of American television. 
yeah. I think the, the Japanese would not make fun of American television the same way. And I oh. think the fact that, you know, they're playing good vibrations in the first, you know, they're, they're playing a <laughs> more rip from that. And if you know yeah. anything about it, it's brilliant. They were like Death Race. They made a reference to Death Race. I mean, that's like a B movie in America. <laughs> the late 80s, early 90s. And that's like, or they just like, I'm on episode three. And obviously they're making fun of a lot of stuff. So that, yeah. that's how I view it. But that, that, you're not in that show. So so I want to talk about show. I, I watched it though. I loved it. I thought it was fun. Um but yeah, no, and, and my counter to the argument of, well, it's not the original cast. Well, yeah, we, we may not be the original cast. We're not trying to copy the original cast. We're, we're never trying to just copy something. We're bringing our own acting techniques and tools that we've learned throughout the years to be able to bring this character to life. Because if we're just mimicking it, it's not acting, it's lying. And um, so we have to rely on, you know, sometimes our choice for this one line may not be the exact choice as the Japanese counterpart, but we're still trying to get the story moving and keep the same emotional resonance, the same, you know, so if you're not seeing the original, you know, you're not hearing the original Japanese cast, I'm sorry, but if you go to see a play, you're probably not seeing the original cast there too. I doubt you're ever going to get a chance to see the original cast of Hamlet. So they, they are kind of all long dead. <laughs> so. That's terrible. That's terrible. Well, I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just, it, if, I mean, that's, it's something that does kind of get me sometimes when they're like, oh, it's not the original cast, so it's not as good. And it's like, but we're not trying to be the original cast. We're trying to be our own cast and we're trying to do our own thing. You know, like we, <laughs> we, we, we can't all be Ric Flair. Come on. No, <laughs> not everybody wants to be Ric Flair nowadays. Yeah. You can't all be Jay Lethal. Come on. <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. Jay Lethal's awesome. I love Jay Lethal. And then, and then obviously I do want to talk about him because Alibaba is a fun character. <laughs> I enjoyed the first season of Magi. I enjoyed the fact that he gets a major power upgrade in that entire series. I mean, like a legitimate one. Like he goes from being a somewhat badass character to being like an ultra badass character. And yeah. what is this like? Because this is your third major role in anime. And I think Magic did not get enough credit for what it did because I thoroughly enjoyed it. This was like right around the time I was coming into Crunchyroll. I think this is like my like sixth or seventh series that I watched on Crunchyroll. And I'm like, man, this is some good shit. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I really wanted a third season to this. Um, and it was really cool to be able to, this was, you know, the <clears> first <throat> show I did that actually got a second season. I wasn't expecting that because we just got through the first one. And as you said earlier, you don't know how long these things are going to run. Typically, a lot of anime will run concurrent with the source material because they're trying to promote each other. The anime is trying to promote people to go buy the source material as it's still fresh and still being circulated. Uh, Magi got through its second season, which was, you know, again, I got to go, I got to go deeper into Alibaba with that, um, with a lot more of his journey and, and his awakening, his kingliness, essentially. It was really fun <laughs> for me. Um, but then it ended um, and we were hoping for a third season and the manga ended. And since then, I, I still see people on Reddit saying, when's Magi season three going to happen? And I, I'm I'm hopeful without being optimistic <laughs> about it. Yeah. And, and, and obviously I'm, I'm going to hold the question that, that I'm curious about until after I show this other character. And this is uh -oh. a fun character. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Look at that. So, so I, I'm just gonna I'm gonna preface this, and I'm also gonna throw up another character just just to prove a point here. There's this character I'm also. Uh, I was going I was like, uh, yeah, I knew exactly. What and, 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 and and it's another <laughs> another. So so I just want to make this crystal clear. These are guys. I just want to make that crystal clear, everybody. I, I I need to make it crystal clear. It's okay to be confused. You know, <laughs> it's it it took me a minute too. Okay. Well, I mean, debatable with their guys. I mean, well, no, I think I'm trying to remember go through his whole story because at the first few seasons, I saw him as a doll. He was a homunculus, like he was. Gr Growlithe uh, is Andronimus. Andron Androgynous, yes, yes. Thank and, you, and thank and you. Not, not the galaxy, but but I, I thought Gother. I thought Gother was created, but. 
and I think Gother is created as as kind of a homunculus or a doll or a living doll or something like that. But I'm suspecting that wasn't always the case. I haven't read all the manga, so um, yeah. I, but I, fish I eye, yeah, fish eye's the same thing. Fish eye's a homunculus, so fish eye. I I don't know if fish eye's got a gender. Fish eye, fish eye. I think is considered to be a male. Um, I know yeah, it, yeah, it goes by male pronouns, and yes. uh, and uh, well, did they ever in the request? Viz dub? Fish eye goes by male pronouns in the Viz dub. Yeah, still dub. still goes by male pronouns, um, and and refers to their brothers, but at the same time, uh, tries to pass as as a woman a lot of the times, and also so, acts 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 very much, acts very much so, yeah. Um, so, and, and, I, <laughs> that was an interesting so, 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 uh, challenge. So, 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 we go into to this character, though, and we get the fish on a little bit. Seven Deadly Sins. I mean, that's in a beyond popular anime. And I think there's been like four or five seasons of that, possibly more. Yep. It was on Netflix, which was a big deal. I think it was one of the Netflix's first like exclusive animes. And what is that like? Because, you know, it, it, it's a different game now, I feel, with, with anime. And yeah. obviously, I mean, it's changed where you have four or five major U.S. players. And then when you come over to Netflix, Netflix has over 100 million people all over the world who basically they have customers to. And, you know, it's a huge platform. Not everybody's there for anime, but they could potentially be there for anime. And yeah. so what is that like for you? Because I think it's a game changer. And I just had Megan Holland's head on. And she's in the new Pokemon on Netflix. And I think it is very much a game changer when you're like, I'm a major character in a Netflix exclusive anime show. So I don't know how that sort of fits into your world per se, and even what that means for you. But it, 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 I would imagine it's a very cool place to be per se. It was. And this was a really interesting um, product for it because it was one of Netflix's first uh, oddly enough, it was one of their first exclusively airing animes, but it wasn't one of their first licensed animes. It was actually licensed and then like co-licensed by Netflix and somebody else. So afterwards, Netflix would start licensing their own on under their own umbrella. Um, so with Seven Deadly Sins, we knew it was going to Netflix. Um, I hadn't heard anything about it at the time I was auditioning for it. And I, I auditioned for Meliodas, which was another Yuki Kaji role. So <laughs> that was the one that Bryce got out on me. And he also has another Yuki Kaji role in, in Aaron Yeager. So I think he and I may go into competition with that at some point. Um, but yeah, I auditioned for this and, you know, I was thinking, this looks fun. This looks like it's going to be cool. And I'm really happy it's going to go on Netflix. It's going to get some good exposure there. And I remember at that point, I had recorded a bunch of shows. I was already done with Excel World, Magi, uh, Toradora. And every single one of them, I was thinking, you know, this may get me, you know, to a, a much higher plane of existence or something. But even then, I found my name wasn't really known. I mean, there were still fans of the shows, absolutely. But um, I still wasn't really good about marketing myself out there. And... When it came to Seven Deadly Sins, I found when I was going to conventions afterwards, people were more familiar with that than any of my other roles, probably mostly because it was on Netflix and just so widely accessible. I mean, anybody who has Netflix, like you said, is not going to be there exclusively for anime. But if there's going to be an anime, if they like anime and they have Netflix, I mean, I, I can guarantee there are more non-anime fans that have Netflix. Well, I don't know. I can't make any guarantees. Sorry, I'm speaking out my butt right now. But what I'm saying is that it would have a much wider audience than just people going to the anime-specific services. They would see this, even if they're not an anime fan, maybe become an anime fan off of it. Or even if they weren't aware of it, it's there. It's on Netflix's homepage, and you've got the service, so why not look at it? And sure enough, like I got more cosplayers, more people coming up to me in conventions for that than any other show I had done at that point. And even still to this day, I get a lot more people coming up to me for Gother. Because isn't it the idea that also people come into things on Netflix where that thing is staying on Netflix? Once Netflix licensed something, and I don't know exactly how it all works, whether Netflix has ownership or they have a big term lease on it, whatever it is, 
I don't know the whole inner workings of the business and I'm not going to make a speculation on that, but it's there for a while. And Netflix mm-hmm. is always adding other content. And anytime you add new content into an already existing library, a lot of other things have the potential. And also, like, I just started watching Seven Deadly Sins. You know, the show is eight, nine years old at this point, and I'm now just starting to get into it, which means I'm a new fan to it. So I don't know what your voice sounds like <laughs> with this character. It's going to be a bit. It's going to be like but, but you, seven you, or so. The, the point is that you get what I'm saying. And so it's yeah. kind of a weird thing. And I, I guess my, my question out of this is that because it's Netflix and they have all this stuff and then they brought in Cowboy Bebop and then now they're bringing in One Piece as a live action, all that stuff sort of leads downhill, I feel. Uh, it, 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 I into mean, all this anime stuff now. Yeah. I mean, it's. <laughs> Again, I don't really know the inner workings myself of the license. As the actor, I don't. I'm not privy to what's going on with a lot of the negotiations or behind the scenes stuff. So, again, with Seven Deadly Sins, I know it wasn't licensed exclusively by Netflix. It was licensed in partnership with Netflix, and then they continued to start licensing things under their own umbrella. Um, and then they also and then they got to... other stuff too. Like they mm-hmm. have a bunch of stuff that is not theirs. So they have yeah. like ten seasons of One Piece. So now, if you're a One mm-hmm. Piece fan. You might come to Netflix and then it's there. And that's what I think is really kind of why a lot of attention has been brought to it. And yes. why it's so interesting because it's kind of like if you have five shows that Netflix either licensed or co-licensed on Netflix, and then you got a show that brings everybody to that, well, you're going to stay there and watch everything else. Yeah, absolutely. And Netflix can revive, like you said, it can revitalize anything. I. I think Netflix is pretty much the reason why Shit's Creek lasted as long as it did, because when it was put on, it got a huge revitalization of people of eyes on it. So well, it's a, it's a huge happy. platform with a lot of influence. I'm very happy today with Netflix. That's all I'm yeah. going to say. They're, they're on 25 <laughs> bucks today. Oh, um, I still need to. I still need and, to and, and I and I have I have shares of Netflix. So there, there you go. <laughs> um, they they only lost 970 thousand subscribers in quarter two. When people thought they were going to lose two million, that's a uh, big miscalc. Everybody thought they were going to lose two million, and they lost <laughs> half. They lost less than half of that. So, well, gosh, I'm, good. yeah, I'm, I'm, I still got my subscription. I still need to get through Stranger Se- Stranger Things season four. I'm really curious what the, because uh, I also have Paramount Plus, and I want to watch that new South Park Stream of Wars uh, special just to see what they not, what their take is on all this. Plus is. Paramount Plus has one show. The only show that matters, <laughs> Knuckles. Coming. <laughs> oh no, I watched the offer on it. I like that. I'm a huge Godfather fan, so I'm telling you, the Knuckles show is gonna blow everybody out of the water. <laughs> it's it, it's gonna out. be the greatest thing ever. It's it's gonna be so good, everybody. Um, <laughs> but, 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 but I I I digress on that front. Um, but um obviously I, I do want to dive into, into some other stuff, and, and I'm actually very curious because this is like your fourth really big role in a very short amount of time and, and i am curious and obviously we're gonna talk about ibo and demon mm-hmm. slayers and some sailor moon in a second here and some gundam divers but why do you think that that you've had all these massive roles because you don't have 400 500 600 roles you know i'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out some other people's names out there you know jeff nimoy is a good example megan holland head who i just had on you know i've had a few others you know, Dorothy Fawn, who's been around forever, Steve uh, Staley was just on. And those people have had a lot of roles and big and small roles. You've had, I think, like less than 50, I want to say. Uh, probably. Probably. And, 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 and I think either 70 or 80 percent of them are lead roles or major supporting character roles. And so I'm really curious because because I was obviously I researched you and I was very puzzled by that. I'm like, <laughs> How the hell am I supposed to write this interview? Like every role, a major <laughs> role. Like, um, well, no, I mean, yeah, I, I'm looking at my own IMDb right now. Forgive the narcissist. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to get a, a a picture of my like a snapshot of what I've done over the past <laughs> ten years. Um, I mean, it's twelve years, and you have like seventy to eighty percent of all your roles are like major roles, and it's so weird. It's I think so a lot of them. Weird. I mean, a lot of them become that way. Um. I mean, I'm going to give a lot of uh, 
a lot of credence to just my luck of genetics of just having the voice that I do because it's a very like I'm I'm in my 30s right now and I can still sound pretty young and also you know like I can sound like teenager adult kind of stuff like that and anime is rife with them so um <laughs> I consider a lot of luck on that and um Again, I'm just, I'm really, I really like the hero's journey. So maybe that's what's come through in my auditions. I really can't tell what it has been because I haven't been the decision maker on a lot of this. I audition for as much as I can and it's the casting directors or the clients that make the final decision. If it were up to me, you know, I'd get everything I ever auditioned for. <laughs> but then you probably would hear me ruin a bunch of dubs because I would be taking a lot of roles that I, that probably would be a lot better suited for other people. Um, so, yeah, I can't say why that has been the case. I can say it's been a fun ride, and I've been very, very grateful for it, and that I've been able to get these opportunities to to carry these these stories and these characters. Um, and I, I always want to do that. I always want to be. I always want to have a character that's going to stick around for longer than an episode, and that I can really sink my teeth into from one moment to the next, from one scene to the next. Yeah, and the, 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 there's a great character that, that puts us right there, and that, that's IBO <laughs> Biscuit, because mm -hmm. IBO Biscuit is this guy, for, for those who, who are interested, he's very much a strategic guy. Uh, this is a great, great, great thing. I saw the greatest tweet on this. Oh, no, I won't be killed to, to prove the point of loss that war causes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, my God. I got to tell you, when I went into this uh, the studio for that character, for Biscuit, the very first session I went in for, because I auditioned for uh, uh, Orga and Mikazuki, and then they gave me Biscuit afterwards. Um, so I go in, I take a look at the character design. It's my first time seeing it, and Nobuo, one of the producers of Sunrise Studios, who produces Gundam, sh all the Gundam shows, um, he was there with the director and I looked at him in the eye when I looked at this character, I was like, so I'm the fat friendly technician of a dark Gundam series. Who's trying to put his two sisters through school. How many episodes do I last? And he laughed. He, he broke down. He didn't tell me he, but he just kind of gave me a knowing wink. I was like, how many episodes am I going to last? Seriously? Like I, and I was surprised. I was surprised. But sure enough, the cat is, you know, spoilers. The casting director comes up to me one time in the middle, like when we're in the middle of recording this and the last episode just released a day before she comes up to me and goes, so did you uh, watch the last episode? I was like, uh, no. She's like, oh, and just walks away. <laughs> just well, like, let's, 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 let's ruin everything for everybody. Just to get it out. Yeah. Um, Biscuit gets killed. To put it nicely, and it's so is so everybody else. Every, in <laughs> Gundam, Gundam IBO is one of those like Gundam Wing type shows where you're in for despair. It is not a happy show. <laughs> it, it, it is the most brutal Gundam show ever. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it really puts Gundam Zeta to shame. It seriously puts the last five episodes of Gundam Zeta to shame. <laughs> like it puts it to shame. I don't know. Have you seen the last five episodes of Gundam Zeta? I have not actually. <laughs> okay, watch IBO and then watch the last five episodes of Gundam Zeta. You don't need to know anything that's going on. Basically, okay. Tomino, who was the director and pretty much got created Gundam, probably was having like a bad month, right? Like during the last five episodes of Zeta, because legitly so many people die in the last five episodes. And then IBO, I think IBO. So he like Evangelion did. He, oh no, did. Yeah, except 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 he killed people. Some people deserve to die, and others did not. Um. <laughs> well, I, we got a question here. Actually, I just noticed. Um, for people interested in moving to cities that have dubbing, what advice would you give them? What should they prepare for? Um, well, right now there's really only two cities to move to for dubbing. There, uh, three. There's. California, Los Angeles, there's Dallas, Texas, and there's New York, New York City. A lot of dubbing, a lot of anime is going to Texas right now, especially with the Crunchyroll Funimation merger owned by Sony. So uh, they've really been trying to get a lot of stuff back in-house. We were work working remotely a lot during COVID, but the nature of anime dubbing, dubbing to picture, really 
is much better suited for an in-person environment to be actually in the studio. So it's hard for LA actors to get over to Texas if they're going to be doing it entirely in studio. But if they're going to keep it a hybrid thing with remote open, you know, we'll still get the opportunity for that. Uh, LA is a really big hub. We've got Bang Zoom, Studiopolis, VSI, a bunch of studios out here that do dubbing. Um, and they do more than just anime dubbing, live action, uh, things like that. Uh, but they, what you should prepare for, though, is these are, depending on which city you go to, New York or LA, very expensive. So prepare a few months living expenses and be ready to find a job that can kind of make ends meet because voiceover ebbs and flows. I still struggle to pay bills with voiceover alone. I'm doing a lot of gig work to try and make ends meet, but be prepared to try and make your own men ends meet. Also, and... not, not to interject. No, no, no. Yeah. There, there are a lot of people who they might have a part-time job or what they do is they do training videos. They might mm -hmm. do commercial work and mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff that happens. Also, if you can, a lot of people might be doing script writing if you can get into mm -hmm. that. And so all of a sudden, there, there's a lot of stuff that people do that's not so called, I guess, because there's a lot of stuff that has to get done in this mm -hmm. that's not the actual voice work, if that makes any sense. And I don't think I'm speaking out of term with that. No, Whereas, no, no. Actually, that's Robin a lot of. Does a lot of training videos. You know, mm -hmm. he, he's, um, in case you don't know, he's Rainer from Attack on Type. Um, he voices Rainer. So. He does a lot of stuff. He also does Stain from uh, My Hero. Um, yeah. He was on my other show and he was talking about this. So I think it's safe to say he also, a bunch of these people also might be doing podcast stuff. Mm -hmm. They might be doing podcasts for major companies. Streaming, so wrestling, <laughs> anything we can there. Um, but yeah, no, a lot of actors have turned to script adaptation. And there's a lot of work for that available now because... There's a lot more anime being released than ever before. I think every season, just just for three months, they're releasing more anime than the first five years of my career put together. <laughs> I'm seeing so much. The, the studios are pumping out productions, and that means that there's going to be a lot more work for script adaptation and all these other places that really need to happen to make this kind of industry function. So um, yeah, just be prepared to find something else while you're putting in the numbers game, because you're gonna have to audition a hundred times to get one role. And... It's also, I'm almost gonna throw something else out. I'll be wary of scams. Mm -hmm. I, I yes. forget who who has a book. There, there, there's, there's a voice actor. There's a couple of books. Uh, she, there's she, James she gonna, Alberger, yeah, she, and then there's Yuri Lowenthal and Tara Platt have one out. Both of those are really good books. And then, then there, there's another uh, actress, and I forget her name, but but she she has a book out that that's not voice acting, but it's all about how to avoid scams in, oh, in the yeah. entire acting game. And so yeah. because there are things out there on their sites that say, hey, pay me $100, and I'm going to get you out there. And they're really looking, and they might charge you 100 bucks and they're not going to help you much. And so that's the other thing too, that you have to be aware of is you got to be wary of certain people who could help you. Um, you know, I'm not going to say who publicly, but if you're in the know and you go through a certain amount of people on my show, there's a common thread of about six people who have been on my shows in the last three years. Um, and those six people have one person in common. And so I'm not going to say who it is that is over promising for lack of a better word. Um, yeah. And, and and but but I'm not going to incriminate anybody. I'm not right. going to incriminate anybody. <laughs> right. um, I'm not going to no, six people either. Do your research, obviously, on on anybody you're connected with. Um, VoiceoverResourceGuide.net is a great place to learn where some reputable classes, reputable resources are, such as demo production and uh, casting agencies and stuff like that. So 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 obviously I want to get back to biscuit because yeah. biscuit gets killed. Okay, <laughs> yeah. and and and, and it becomes and, a jelly covered biscuit. Yes, exactly. It's it's it's, it's blood flavor. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, terrible. Um, but I also feel that with IBO, there are certain deaths that are massive turning points in that series. You know, and biscuit is one of them. There's another one. Uh, As we were talking about with Zeta, like you were mentioning with Zeta, some of them unnecessary. Some of them didn't deserve it. I mean, I mean, you know, you can make the argument whether Biscuit deserved it or not, but that, that's not the point. 
Um, but one of the things is that I think Biscuit's a massive turning point, and then there's a few other characters when they die are massive turning points. And so what is this like for you? Because while you don't necessarily last, you do last for a pretty long time in the series. And I last, yeah. <laughs> pretty influential, man. His pretty dad. well through the first episode or for the first season and um i thought like I, I didn't know how impactful it was going to be when it was going to happen i knew it was going to happen i just didn't know what was going to happen <laughs> i just get that out there um but it was in the middle or near the end of the first season and as anime usually does is in the middle of the season they'll switch up the opening and ending tracks sometimes after 13 episodes or after a bigger turning point they'll change the the end music the credits music for the end and the opening music so i was disappointed about that halfway through of ibo because uh orphans no namida is one of my favorite anime endings ever I think it is a banger song, um, and I was disappointed when it went away. So we're recording the biscuit death scene, and it's very emotional, and I'm getting emotional. And then, like, I try and keep it contained because you don't really want to ugly cry <laughs> in the studio. You get kind of gunked up when you're doing that kind of thing. You still want to have some dictation. But then I hear the opening notes of Orphans No Namida <laughs> play after he passes it had been gone from the show for a couple of episodes and then they brought it back for him and i'm just like oh why you gotta do this to me so i i knew at that point okay this is this is something you know because because i mean you know he, he i mean i'm the first person to say that that like you sort of knew it was coming mm -hmm. and but but also it wasn't the worst thing in the world either, especially with the way season two went, where everybody gets off. Yeah. <laughs> and and I mean, everybody, like from the different seven families, people getting killed from the turbines, people getting killed. I mean, it's a bloodbath and it's not, I mean, when it happened. Biscuit was just an hors d'oeuvre. He was the appetizer. Have a plate of biscuits. You're going to get a plate of meat later. But but, but, but I, I, think, I think the reason why I bring this up is that it's not that his death wasn't significant, but it also wasn't like, oh man, I feel like we're being singled out. I mean, the yeah. entire show of IBO is is really the entire fight for freedom and, and the cost it, it is and how a whole sector and a whole unit is basically dying for this freedom, which is yeah. ludicrous if you think about it on, on a symbolic level. And, and what is that like for you? Because you're in a Gundam show you're in a Gundam show that is not like any other Gundam show that's ever been out there before. And people hate Mario Kata's work. They hate her work or they love her work. And you either <laughs> love IBO or you hate it. You cannot be neutral on IBO. Nobody has ever said, I'm neutral on IBO. Yeah, no, no I've never heard that. I've only heard. People say, this is the worst Gundam ever or this is the greatest thing ever. <laughs> it's, it's one or the other. Yeah. And what, what is that like for you? as a voice actor to have such strong opinions of a show that you're a part of, because kind of, isn't that what you want? I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, I love Gundam IBO mostly because I grew up watching Gundam wing on Toonami. So it had much more of that feel to it. I think, um, I know the, you know, I've, I've watched a lot of Gundams, but what gets to me is that there's the universal canon, the UC that, carries over from one Gundam show to the next. And then you have these sideshows like IBO and Wing, which are not part of the UC, but just their own little standalone stories. So I felt really happy being able to jump in on that and like have a, a, a complete story in itself in this universe. Um, I don't know if that's where a lot of the criticism came from. I don't know if it was just the story aspect no, of it. I don't I think it was that. I don't think it was that. I think what it was no. is that I think DV the extremity of the, to the tone of it, the tone of and it. Also, the idea that you're dealing with child, children, soldiers, mm -hmm. and, and Double O dealt slightly with it, but it didn't deal with it the same way IBO dealt with it. I yeah, think but when do you get a, when do you get anime like that nowadays? I mean, even the ones that put like that are really really dark. Like it's either you get really really grim dark or you get really happy fluffy, and there's really rarely kind of a. I'm not even looking for a balance, but just like something more in the middle of that spectrum and i felt gundam was kind of a good 
you know, it didn't have a lot of light moments to it, but it wasn't so absolutely grim, dark, like everything was hopeless. They had hope in there. And that's a story that I, I always love being a part of, you know, one that has, that doesn't have to be so tropic and, and outlandishly <laughs> anime, but this is what I grew up on. This is what anime can do is these kind of adult storytelling in an outlandish yeah. world. Um, but nowadays I'm seeing a lot of, you know, fluff pieces or, I, I, or, I or also think, fan I mean, I'm, I'm 29 and not to get too political, <laughs> but I think the, the, the generation, I mean, I grew up watching Gundam when I was seven, right? Mm -hmm. Like I grew up watching things my parents didn't know any of the wiser. My parents are, they didn't like put me in front of the television and say, the television is your babysitter per se. Right. But they didn't know anything about anime. And I was watching things like Outlaw Star and I was exposed to all this stuff. And I think the new generation of fans who are 15, 16, 17 have never really witnessed something like IBO before. No. And I don't think that, 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 and I think that's what it is partially is that. You know, they've grown up in a different world than, than I grew up in. I was in third grade when 9-11 happened. And I think that that's part of the problem. And that's what I think IBO really hit is this idea saying, look, this is what anime used to be like, good, dark, brooding, and there's real consequences. And mm -hmm. we're not going to have panty and stockings with bright colors <laughs> and ridiculous. But there's things. a place for that. There's a place for that. But it's just it's a, a that I see. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I'm seeing a lot less of IBO type shows than I am of of more like, you know, I mean, even in action shows like Excel World or Magi, they're, they're, you know, bombastic, very, very outwards. I mean, I mean, let, let's talk about the other Gundam show you were in, which is Gundam. <laughs> speaking Gundam. of bombastic, speaking of light and colorful. <laughs> and, and look, and look, Gundam build divers and Gundam build tri fighters and all those series, they're brilliant. I to, loved to, it. To, to, to the, the T, because what they've done is that they've created what you see, they've created a fun you see where, where every character and every person can show up whether they're alive or dead mm -hmm. in Gundam, build, build whatever, you know? And the, the, I think there's four seasons of it. I think you were in at least one of them. I, I don't was know. in the, I don't remember if we had, did we have two seasons of the first? I don't, I, I, I know I, I did one full season and yeah. then I came back later as a cameo. And, and so what is this like? Because this is the complete opposite, but it, it has its place and it's brilliant. And I like the fact that you have all these Gundams from all these different shows and you have new characters, but then you have references to other characters in there. And it's really paying so much tribute as a Gundam fan that to a show that in a series that's been around for almost 50 years now. Yeah. Um... <laughs> What was especially fun about that one is I actually got to pilot a Gundam in that one. <laughs> there he is. Um, yeah, I was hoping Biscuit would get to be in the pilot seat at some point, but that never happened. So um, this was fun to actually say, hey, there's a Gundam that's you know my own. I get the Double O Diver <laughs> Ace. I am the pilot of Double O Diver Ace. And Gunpla is a thing. I have two really good friends that are huge into Gunpla. We play video games together all the time. They have so many model kits that they're always posting on our Discord group of like, look how I painted this one or look at what I did to this one and how customized it is and stuff. I had never done, I, I still haven't done a Gunpla kit yet, but this whole show about Gunpla <laughs> it's just them, like, both ears, like, one on each ear going, when are you going to buy a kid? When are you going to buy a kid? When are we going to do some gun plug? When are we going to... So <laughs> that was fun for me. I was like, okay, I get, I actually have a Gundam that really means something to me personally, because otherwise it would be a paradox of choice. Do I get, you know, the Gundam Wing, or do I get the, the Barbados, or neither of which I piloted, but this one, I do have a Double O Diver Ace kit at home that I bought, and I'm just waiting for the right time that we can all get together and put that together and kind of just method act, live the, the build divers. I really want a video game like that. Like, you know, amiibo type build diver type deal. No, I, I, I enjoyed it. It's on my list. I enjoyed the first two seasons of the entire gun and build, you know, yeah. series. And I'm going to get to the next two because I just think that they are utterly brilliant. And I think, I think that they're just, Paying so much tribute to so much Gundam, and and as a huge Gundam fan, and 
I, I buy all the Blu-rays of Gundam and like I'm yeah. super into <laughs> it and I'm broke because of it. <laughs> that, 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 that's where I'm at. They ain't so, cheap. So, so. <laughs> they ain't cheap. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's not, it's, it, they've gotten cheaper. I mean, narrative is. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, people say, oh, anime is so expensive nowadays. You know, they see these $120 Blu-ray box sets for the entire season. I'm just like, that is nothing. I remember going to freaking Suncoast as a kid, buying a $30 Dragon Ball Z VHS with only one audio track on it for three episodes. Like we were paying $10 per episode. You're getting a 26 episode series for $120. I don't want to hear people talking about it's how anime is expensive. expensive. I mean, you and I'm showing my age now. I'm just, I'm going, you know, back in my day. No, I mean, you can buy Gundam Wing for like 45 bucks on Amazon. Yeah. Seriously, the whole season. You can buy yeah. IDO for about 60 bucks. The entire that season. used to be 20, 25 bucks for three episodes on a VHS and you didn't get the dual track English or Japanese with subtitles. You just had the English dub and that was it. You had no option. Oh, I, I remember those days. I remember, yep. those days. <laughs> I remember the days where, where you know, you know, a DVD came out and it was a big deal when you had a DVD and somebody's like, oh, I got an episode on a DVD. I remember renting uh, Sailor Moon and Blockbuster and this is actually what got me into, this is actually kind of my awakening as an anime voice actor, as an anime, like, you know, what goes on on both ends of things. I rented a Sailor Moon Blu-ray back in like middle school or high school put it in and my house was always so loud. So I would often have the closed captions on or the uh, subtitles on. And I noticed the subtitles weren't matching what the English track was saying. Yeah. I was like, what the heck is going on here? Sure enough, I switched it over to the Japanese. I'm just like, oh, oh. And that became the whole like, wait, there's a whole other side to this. Anime is from another country. <laughs> That was really young. Yeah, so. Speaking about Sailor Moon, because obviously I mentioned Fish Eye before. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Fish so Eye. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> what is this like? Because it, it, there's a word and, 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 and it's slightly offensive. I'm going to say it anyway. Fish Eye is a trap, everybody. <laughs> I wouldn't, I fish. don't, I, yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to go there, but Fish Eye. Um... <laughs> was very interesting for me because I grew up, Sailor Moon Supers was the first Sailor Moon that I watched on Toonami. I remember watching the old uh, Deke dub on Toonami. And I, I thought that was one of my favorites because it was one of the first ones I was exposed to. So when I got the audition, I mean, I well, I heard all my friends getting into Sailor Moon because we had three seasons before Supers and I had a bunch of friends auditioning and getting in uh, into the cast. So it's like, ah, uh, you know, hopefully when the fourth season rolls around, I want a shot at maybe the Amazon trio or Pegasus. I don't know if I'm, you know, I was excited to be a part of anything. Um, and they gave me an audition for all three of the Amazon trio and for Pegasus. And I got a call back for Fisheye and Pegasus. For Pegasus, they said, okay, it sounds really close to what we're going for. Can you just try it a little more this way? For Fisheye, can you just try it a little more this way? Um, inevitably, I got Fisheye. And what was interesting about that one is that I had no base of reference for even the Deke dub. Because back then, Fisheye was portrayed as a woman. They didn't want to have a cross-dressing so, uh, seducer. So let's, let's even talk about that. Because obviously... It, it, and I think this is safe to say, uh, back when Sailor Moon first came to America, there was a whole Americanization mm -hmm. of anime. There was a whole, I guess, political agenda. And I don't know how, how, how we, we, we call it where, you know, they didn't want to. It's the same thing with, what was it, Neptune and, and, and um, your, your, your Uranus. Uranus or, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. When they became yeah, cousins. I, I, was, yeah, I guess the planets messed up and they were cousins yeah, yeah. or something like that. And then Crystal sort of fix that i think and i mean i think yeah. what wound up happening is that obviously i think people and society has become more progressive by nature i also think there's been less of an idea saying we have to americanize every little bit but for, for lack of a better word i think i think that that's the only way i think i can say it and i think crystal fixed that and then obviously they wanted i think to stay truer to, to how it was intended yeah. um and so what was this like because now you're really playing the true version of Fisher, if that makes yes. any sense. Yes, I'm playing, I'm the first 
um, I'm the first to play fisheye as a male. Um, again, still debatable considering fisheye is a homunculus, so I don't really know how gender affects that. But um, yeah, just this very androgynous character, but with a uh, male-based voice, I guess. So I uh, I had a, a bit of trepidation going into that because again, there was this would be the first time this was presented this way, not because I was worried about you know, people not accepting it being presented that way, but worried about if my presentation of it would do it justice, because this is a much truer form, a much truer translation. It's, of also, the it's also the fact that, that, that you're coming into Sailing Moon. That has such mm -hmm. a huge mandate. Yes. yes. And, and it's kind of like if you go into a show that everybody's kind of saying, oh, this show could go either way. It's a coin toss. There's probably less pressure because, you know, what is if maybe you miss the mark a little bit, you know, there's not as much pressure. You know, if a show only has 100,000 circulating mangas out there and isn't viewed as like the top shoujo in the bar, or for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, I think it's a fair statement on Sailor Moon. You yes. know, DBZ is the bar for, for shonen by, by, mm -hmm. by nature. I, I think those two statements are, are very hard to argue against. Um, yes. So now you're coming into a show that is the bar. That is the level that every shoujo wants to meet or beat. And if you get past, I guess, the Sailor Moon test, for lack of a better word, you're in like the upper echelons. It, it, I mean, I, I don't think I'm saying anything controversial at the moment. Um, and so, no, um, but but even going into that, I mean, you, you also have to say, hey, I kind of just made it. Because now I've done a Sailor Moon character too, right? Like, yeah, again, it's kind of like if you have done, even if you've only done 10 episodes on DBZ, You've done ten episodes on DBC. It's it's kind of a big deal. Yeah, I uh, I mean, I still want to. I'm hoping there's going to be more DBC in the future because even though I wasn't a part of the major Pokemon franchise, I was in a Pokemon, a couple of Pokemon products on their YouTube show, <laughs> and so with Pokemon and Sailor Moon, if I can get into Dragon Ball Z, that'd be the trifecta of my childhood right there. <laughs> that'd be my that's my big three. You know, people say the big three, One Piece. Uh, Naruto and Bleach back in the Shonen Jump days, but no, the true big three, Pokemon, Dragon Ball Z, and Sailor Moon. At least for me. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> I mean, I'm 29. It, 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 let me ask you a question, because this is how I view things. Pokemon is still popular. Mm -hmm. Dragon Ball Z is still popular. Sailor mm -hmm. Moon is still popular. I mean, One Piece has been going on for like 25 years now. <laughs> let, let's, let's not pretend and say that One Piece isn't also like old for for lack of a better word i mean yeah. it's been going on since the like i think one piece the manga came out in like 1999 or 1998 that's, <laughs> yeah that's, that's sounds about right i mean it's not like that this is what's crazy my hero academia is a baby compared to one piece dragon ball z and and sailor moon and pokemon it's a baby it, yeah it's and I see it having the same kind of staying power, but there's just not going to be beating the big three. There's just those things are not just in anime, but in mainstream. It's, Everybody, it's, it's even the big four. I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm calling One Piece. It's the big four because yeah. at this stage, One Piece is in that upper echelon. Yeah, but I would say, you know, if you go to any non-anime fan, they're going to know the three. They're going to at least know the titles, Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, and Pokemon. Even if they've never watched an anime in their life, I guarantee you'll find more people. I, I guarantee aware you, of those. LeBron James knows who Goku is, knows who Goku <laughs> is, and knows who Sailor Moon is, and he knows who the Teen Titans are. Yep, I'm. I'm also happy to see a lot of other athletes embrace that, especially in the wrestling world. You know, trying to tie it there. I see a lot of wrestlers getting into anime, like Sasha Banks, I mean, and I mean, you have Kylie Austin Ray. Creed. Kylie Ray comes out. Smiley Kylie. <laughs> With a Pokemon on her chest. I mean, let, let's, yep. let's, and, and I don't mean that in, in any sexual way. I mean, legitly, it's like, it's like the face of a Pokemon in her chest. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep, pretty much. I'm, I'm just saying, guys, I'm just saying, I mean, Sasha Banks came out of Sailor Moon to the Royal Rumble. Come on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's how we, we, we know that, that, that anime has made it. Absolutely. Is, and I would always say, you know, I always say this that anime and wrestling. The fans sat at the same lunch table. We all sat at the same lunch table 
you know, the kids talking about WWE Raw on Tuesday morning or at the, at the lunch table, we're sitting next to the kids trading Pokemon cards or playing Magic the Gathering or or Yu-Gi-Oh or something. They were not with the jocks and cheerleaders. We all are nerdy over the same things, like the same storytelling. And wrestling is anime. Anime is wrestling. Goku is just Ricky Dozon. Essentially. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what 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 Goku and Superman are John Cena. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's exactly what it is. The rock is Goku. You know, well, I'll Goku. give a shout out to uh another YouTuber, Ben at the Sage, who does a lot of anime breakdowns, and he mentions how Goku is Ricky Dozon, who was this Japanese wrestler back in the 50s. His whole thing was he would bring a friend to the ring to face the villain du jour, the big bad of the day. The big bad would knock Ricky Dozon's friend pillar to post all across the ring until Ricky Dozon comes in and makes the save. Goku. That's just Goku. Goku yeah, sends yeah, the yeah, jobbers yeah. in. Go in, Krillin. <laughs> go in, TN. Go job to Cell or Vegeta, and I'll come in and get the championship afterwards. <laughs> As I always, <laughs> so, yeah, I always say wrestling is anime and anime is wrestling. because I, I mean, you know, it's the you same know, entertainment value. You know what? You know the deal that the WWE Network and Crunchyroll made back mm -hmm. like four or five years ago, where you got three months of WWE Network and three months of Crunchyroll for thirty bucks. Yeah. And guess and what? I, what tag team was promoting it? The New Day. The New Day, my boys. I love it, them. It, it, it's just the way it is. But 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 I do want to get away from from Goku, and I do want to talk about <laughs> Bow Hero here because I love the Bow Hero. The Bow you know, Hero, know, this guy. He, he he's not the Spear Hero. Okay, he's not the spear hero. I don't know how he got played, and, and and this hasn't happened yet. But apparently, he gets played by Multi, which is probably season three of Rise of the Shield Hero. I have no idea how this guy got played. No <laughs> idea. I mean, just look at him. Of all, I don't know he's either. Played, he's the least I would put money on. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm hoping we get a little bit more to do with him in the third season because second season he was just kind of spattered about. Um, I mean, his entire team freaking sold him out, man. You got to get new friends. Yeah. Well, we were speaking about friends. it. It's like I a little bit of spoiler that hasn't been mentioned in the anime yet, but from what I hear from the source material, we were talking about My Hero Academia, and in Rising of the Shield Hero, every one of the heroes are isekai from a different world. Like they didn't share the same universe before they isek got isekai here, and from what I read about Itsuki, he's from a world where everybody gets a power or a quirk and he was going to a school a school for people with these quirks he, he had a very low quirk at that <laughs> yeah but essentially from what i'm gathering they're saying that itsuki is from the world of my hero academia before he got isekai here that's what i'm i'm gathering from from this <laughs> from what i read <laughs> And, but, 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 and sure enough, in that world, they apparently have Spider-Man, or they don't have Spider-Man, because he says the line, with great power comes great responsibility. And then the shield hero has to look at him and go, did you get bitten by a radioactive spider or something? But he's, he's confused. <laughs> so he's from the world of My Hero Academia, which doesn't have Spider-Man. That's all I know about his backstory so far. So so to, to even talk about this, because obviously, I mean, you know, he he he's he's a major character to some degree as far as being one of the four cardinal heroes. Um, but he's mm -hmm. also a supporting character. Um, he 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 also, to put it nicely, is kind of a dick. You know, I mean, yeah. he, 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 uh, I mean, all the other three heroes are real, you know, dicks in, in a lot of ways. Um, but they're all different types of dicks. Um, <laughs> it's the rising of the shield hero, not the rising of the bow hero. It, it, it's not the redemption of the bow hero, except he does no. get some <laughs> in, in the source material. Um, but all, all jokes aside, all jokes aside, um, what is this like to be part of this series? Because season one was one hell of a fucking season. I mean, it was amazing. And then the bow hero has opportunities, and he has good opportunities, bad opportunities. Um, season two was sort of not about the bow hero. There was a few moments, but the bow hero really wasn't in it much. And then obviously I got it. I mean, I know we're getting a season three. Um, that, that's already been confirmed. That's, um, that, that's, that's rare. Anything. Um, yeah. And there's a good chance we're going to get a season four because it's just a great show. Um, and there's just a lot of source material. I'm willing to put money, but 
I don't know anything and I'm not going to force you to reveal anything if you don't want to, but I think it's a safe bet. Um, but what is this like? Because this is another type of thing where it's just a major show you're a part of. Yeah. Um, I wasn't, ex I was really surprised because I got cast in it. I think right before Crunchyroll made their announcement that it was coming out, that it was being dubbed. And when Crunchyroll made that announcement, I saw, I saw the, yeah, the, the hype for it go through the roof. I wasn't expecting that because I'm not so in tune with what's being released nowadays with what's, what manga is being read more so, or what light novels are popularized or are more popular than others. So to see the hype for this and then people were already aware of it. I was excited. I was, I was really happy to be a part of something that people were looking forward to. And then sure enough, yeah, the first season was a wild, wild ride. And um, I, I'm just, I was floored by the end of it. We got an announcement for two additional seasons. Cause we were just talking about this earlier. You know, you don't really know how long a show is going to last. So I've been a part of a lot of shows that left on cliffhangers or never completed. So I was like, okay, this looks like a, a really fun uh, fantasy isekai show. I'm really happy to be a part of it and um, we'll see where it goes. I'm, I'm excited to see the hype behind it. And then, it wasn't until like the end of the first season it really hit me. Like when the, when I saw that this was already announced for two additional seasons, it's rare to get even an additional season announced, but to have two announced right away, I was like, okay, there is something to this. This is because I, I think what what it comes down to. I think the first season blew out everything when when it came out in mm -hmm. two thousand nineteen. I think it was one of the shows that blew out everything. And yeah. I watched the opening twice, the first episode twice. It was that good. And it was 45 minutes, and I'm like, man, they, they came out swinging for the fences here. I, I mean, that first episode of Rise of the Shield Hero came swinging for the fences. And they, they I mean, they, they pulled nothing back. No. And the, the anime was saying, we don't care. And that, that that's what I liked about the show, and that's what I really liked about the show, is that there's no punches pulled. And yeah. I think it's unlike IBO, that it doesn't pull any punches. I think that Rise of the Shield Hero does it in a, I don't want to say a more intellectual way, but does it in maybe a less offensive way, per, per se, and, and also yeah. a more intellectual way. I'm going to need to rewatch it because I haven't actually watched it since it came. the first season came out, and I haven't watched the second season. I wait till I get the Blu-rays of them and, like, you know, support the shows. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it it had a really distinct feel to it really distinct tone that you know we've been inundated with isekai shows and and a lot of fish out of water type of scenarios so this one i thought it was really interesting to really focus in on the one character not really have him be instantly isekai and have a group of of friendly people around him but be like no we're i got i gotta fend for my goddamn self here and also having to freaking figure out knowledge and have the other heroes hate him, have everybody hate him, have to win everybody over. Oh, man. So it's, it's a brilliant show. And it's also the idea, not, not to ruin too much, but your character does get somewhat of a path of redemption. I've read, I've read the light novels. Good. And, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it because <laughs> I'm waiting. I'm just like, he's kind of a dick. But, but he gets a path of redemption and uh, there's some fun stuff. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. To, the the spear hero because because he, he's going to be fun he's going to be a very funny character in season three that's all I'm going to say to everybody if Looking we go down that this. path that's all I'm going to say on that point um but yeah it, it's just a brilliant show and and it's just one of those things where I just think that it's like another thing where you're just like this is what I mean about your career that's so puzzling is that like how did you even get here because I don't get your career it's so confusing. And there's like th two more roles that I'm very <laughs> familiar with, which is, you know, Demon Slayers as yes. Obanyo Ibarai Igudo. Yeah, I, I can. Yeah. I've given up on names, <laughs> man. I've given up on names a long time ago. And then the other one, though, which I'm a big proponent of, is Kuroko's Basketball, and you're Kais. And <sighs> I love Kais. I love Kais so much. Uh, he was so much fun. He was such a snarky, snooty, like... But but so well, let's talk about Kais first, because 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 yeah, I love Kuroko's basketball. I love sports animes. 
by definition. I, I do anime panels, and one of my favorite panels is talking about the three pillars of sports animes and their counterparts. So I compare yeah. Slam Dunk with Kuroko's Basketball. And yes. I loved everything about Kuroko's Basketball. I thought Kuroko's Basketball was the modern-day Slam Dunk. I appreciate that. And, and it's uh, I really loved being a part of that one because it was... Um... You know, I, I love Gigguk on YouTube, and he had this great bit about how there are usually, like, two types of sports anime. There's, like, sports! Oh, my God! Action sports! And then there's sports. You know, the fan service sports. Watch people in bikinis and, and muscly men. So, you know, Yuri on Ice and Free, that would be sports. But <laughs> Kuroko was kind of a weird, like, it had its moments in both. I felt where you had the big like action Dragon Ball Z sports I, or like the Naruto Sharingan. I will use my special eyes on you kind of thing. And then like a very, you know, like a also a very fun friendship story going on. Um, with Kisei, I just had a blast because uh, it's it was a very interesting character to have somebody in college who had all the confidence you don't get this in anime a lot a lot of anime is you know people discovering themselves but and going through the journey of discovering themselves in this sports anime that we did a lot of them knew who they were from their their time in high school together and now that they were separate they were trying to figure out who they were separately so it was a really cool little dynamic there it's also really cool because with, with this character he's beyond talented yeah. And and, and, and and all the 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 five and even Kuroko is beyond talented and Kagami is also beyond talented. So these seven players can all act like you know, you know, you know, they they, they can talk the shit because they could back it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes him interesting because it's hard to hate him as a character. You know, going back to the bow hero, he's a jerk. And you can yeah. hate him for being a jerk with Kaisa essentially, you cannot hate him for being a jerk because he can bring the ball down the court. It's like hating Michael Jordan, where if you're playing <laughs> against Michael Jordan, you have to boo Michael Jordan because it's against your team, but you can't yeah. say Michael Jordan's a bad player, if that makes right. any sense. Right, yeah, you yeah. You can't yeah. say Steph Curry's a bad player. You could say Steph Curry scored against a son of a bitch. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Like, <laughs> And that, that yes. so what is that like for you? Because that also changes, I would imagine, how you voice him. Uh, yeah, because again, he had this arrogance going, and he was this very pretty boy who his journey was losing confidence, or not just losing confidence, but gaining the right kind of confidence instead of instead of projecting this bravado that he had all the time. And I kind of looked at him almost like a kind of like a, a Jake Paul or like a YouTuber, like, you know, like a vlogger kind of person to start with. And, and I was like, you know what, if anybody I would want to see go on a journey of self-redemption and self-discovery, it would be somebody like Jake Paul or something. So let's, let's sink our teeth into this and show, you know, how it's done. So, yeah, because he did have that, you know, he had the throngs of fangirls and and was just very, like, all about his influence and his, his like, <laughs> presentation and everything like that. Um, so that was, a, that was a fun way to go about it. And, and especially just him interacting with the other characters, being so standoff to them and then warming up to them later. It was, it was something very different for me. Honestly, oh, and I, I enjoyed every minute of it. <laughs> and, then, and then obviously I want to talk about Demon Slayers because yes, that's another one. Um, if you read the manga, you know what happens to your character. I'm not going to go and be the guy. Um, but Between that and, and uh, Seven Deadly Sins, I've already been spoiled on a lot of my character ahead of time because I get manga readers at the conventions coming up. Like, especially with Gother, I had a bunch of manga readers come up to me going, oh, you voice Gother, right? I'm, I was only finished with the first season. I'm just like, yeah, I did. And they're like, you're an a-hole. You're an a-hole for what you do. And I'm just like, I, I don't, what, what did I do? What did I do? And then by the middle of the second season, I'm just like, oh, yeah, that, that may have been warranted. That may have been justified. But, uh, but, but but this character that you play, obviously the the serpent snake, you know, Demon Slayer is is a fascinating character. It's very very important. 
you know, to, to the entire thing. And yeah. obviously it does provide a lot of guidance, um, provides a lot of support and really is, you know, a cool character. And so what is this like? Because it's not a major role, but it's an important yeah. supporting role. And it's a relevant one. And I think I think this character comes in the first season. I know this character is in the second season. Yeah. Um, and in both seasons and in the movie, I am pretty much in the last, like, section, the last few yeah, minutes. Yeah, I don't right? remember yeah. the movie. Where in the movie, I have one line. I literally have one line as Igodo, and then they had me do a couple of other characters, but at the very end, it's just Igodo standing on top of a rooftop looking at the sunset and going, I don't believe it. And that's it. That was my one line for the movie. Uh, but no, I'm I'm really excited for what we've got ahead of us with this. It was such a shock to me to see the announcement of who I was all kind of running with in this Hashira group. Because, yeah, he comes in at the end of the first season. He has one or two episodes, a couple of scenes. He's in literally the last five minutes of the second season. That's pretty much all his appearances in the second season. Um, but I do know there's a lot to do with him and a lot of, uh, I know a little bit about where he's going with certain characters. There's and, a lot of stuff that that's going down. And again, yeah. again I don't want... I'm it, this is the this is like the one time where we're, I know what happens too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and I don't want to ruin it because there's people that I know with yeah. Demon Slayer who have not read the manga or are waiting and they're watching the anime and they're trying to remain as spoilers. I figured with IBO with you know Sailor Moon, those things have been out long enough, and also yeah. that fan base sort of knows what goes on. Um, I think with Demon Slayers. You know, and even with Rise of the Shield, I think people get an idea where it's going. And we didn't yeah. really too much with it. Um, but Demon Slayers is, I don't want to be the guy that ruins it. So <laughs> you're not going to get a spoiler. But it, it's very cool. And I and obviously, I mean, they're staying pretty close to, to the manga. I'm looking forward to what I have to do with him. And I had a lot of fun with just the voice and the character. Because I've done a lot of sly characters before. A lot of, like, rival, snarky. I've done, you know, there was... Uh, one Punch Man where I did Speed of Sound Sonic, who's very similar in tone, you know, has this kind of snake-like hiss to him as Igoro does. But then Igoro, I kind of made him even tougher than that. You know, Speed of Sound Sonic is confident, but he's a comic character. He's a comic relief character, whereas Igoro is confident, but he is confident because he is a threat. He is actually got some skill to him. And I didn't know what it was going to be like, because again, I only got the casting when the first season was about to finish. And he's only in the last few episodes. So I was thinking, okay, um, are we getting a second season? Am I going to have more to do in the second season? And, you know, how big is this character? What is it going to, what am I going to want to research um, going forward? And then when I got the, I didn't really know anything about the manga or anything about the show. But when I saw who all the rest of the Hashira were, I was just like, oh, no, we are, we got some shit to do. Because I would see, you know, I was cast alongside Crispin Freeman and Johnny Young Bosch and, and all these heavy hitters. And I'm just like, okay, yeah, no, I, I know yeah, we're all going to go on arc. Let me ask you a question about that, because obviously... If you don't know this by now, um, you voice alone in the booth. Maybe there's an engineer mm -hmm. there, obviously the director's there. Maybe yep. somebody from the, you know, Bang Zoom or the mm -hmm. Japanese side is there for whatever yep. reason. Maybe, you know, I don't know why somebody who's higher up might be there, but not another voice actor is going to be there for the most part. Um, yep. it, it very rarely that does it happen. Um, and when it does, it's for a very good reason. Now, you know, but even when you get saying, oh, man, I'm next to people who've been doing this forever and have all these top roles and have been in shows like Bleach and Code Geass and, you know, and things like Attack on Titan and some other stuff, you know, and you're like, and I'm not saying you're you're not at that level, but you're like, oh, shit, I got to you get this. I, I need to step up my game. Like, oh, shit, I'm around people who've been doing this for the last 20 years or last 15 years who have legitimately brought shows and have brought them to like the promised land for lack of a better word and you're like oh shit this is a big deal i know nothing yeah. about it but i also realize that there's some serious money here or 
that there's no fucking around anymore. I mean, yeah, and I never try to fuck around or anything. I'm always trying to bring my A game, but this one was definitely a very like, okay, I got to really kind of keep focused on everything I've learned so far. And especially because um, the two names I mentioned, Johnny and Crispin, are two people who uh, have seen me since the beginning. Like, I mean, they've seen uh, who I was at the very beginning, 12 years ago. Johnny was the host of that AX Idol competition, I remember. And he and I had met even a couple of times at conventions before then and had just a few small chats. I remember when I won the competition, when he announced my name, he was like, great job, Eric. Don't move to LA and steal my roles or something to that line. <laughs> um, and then when I did move to LA, I did take a couple of classes with Crispin. So, you know, these are two people that... Like Crispin taught me. So being in a scene with him is just like, well, shit, I gotta, I can't, I gotta make sure I'm doing what he taught me. I gotta, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, yeah. So yeah, I took a couple of classes with Crispin. I've interacted with Johnny a number of times. So it was really interesting to be in the scene with them. And I've been in scenes with Johnny a number of times. You know, we were in Toradora together. We were in uh, a gun to my BO together. Um, but just to kind of be in this group, this Hashira group of like standing side by side as opposed to like, you know, scene partners, uh, it was, it's weird, <laughs> but it's, it's a lot of fun and it's, it, it's really humbling. It's, 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 again, I, Johnny was one of my first big, the, the first actors I was a fan of after Trigun and realizing he was a Power Ranger, which I grew up on. I, I watched the original run. That's how old I am. Um, so it was, yeah, it was just great to be amongst this group and in, in, in this kind of show and just to hear the hype around the show as it was airing and people seeing how it's changing kind of the way we look at action anime or, or stuff like that. Like it's the new Shonen big three kind of thing. It's a contender to be part of the, the, the same conversation as Bleach and Naruto. I'm, I'm hearing that. I'm, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. Because I just I like the show, but I'm not really involved in the discourse of it. Um, still, yeah, it's, it's, it's I'm very, really excited for what this show has to offer and what's going to be coming with it. And, and is season three coming out this year or is it next year? I believe later this year they said the Swordsmaster Village arc maybe in fall or winter. So it will be within the next year. Again, I haven't been keeping up. You know, you know, I'm I'm a little bit out of the loop on certain things. You know, yeah. and, and 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 I can't know everything, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I I try. I try to know everything. I just can't. Um, yeah. names and, and when animes are dropped and is is not really my 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 jam. If it appears on Crunchyroll, I pay four or five shows and I watch them, and then I hope. Um, and like I said, so much anime is coming out here. I'm so ADHD that it's just so it, I can't keep focused on one thing or the other anymore. It's I'm getting so many people saying, have you checked this show? Have you checked this show out? And I'm like, I'll add it to the list that I'm never going to get through. So I, I do want to back out of anime and you are a professional wrestler. And in the loose term, yes. <laughs> and, and, and I know that the, you trained and worked for Brian Kendrick's school out there. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I don't want to dive too much into your career because I'm a little unfamiliar with your career. <laughs> I, I just know that the way you take out people sometimes in the ring. Um, and, and you did, you did have a championship for, for a short day. Um, <laughs> I did a little, a nice little tag team championships. Yeah. So, uh, I trained with Brian Kendrick started a couple of years ago or a few years ago. Um, great guy. I, he's been so gracious about how he's taught us and, and the opportunities, opportunities he's offered us. And he would run this monthly comedy show called wrestling pro wrestling, or he still does to this day. And it's twice the wrestling, twice the fun, because it's twice the wrestling. Wrestling pro wrestling. Um, and we would do stupid shit. Like, I was, I remember one of my first matches was a Royal Rumble where a butcher came out, a baker came out, and I was the candlestick maker. So. Um, but isn't that and, what wrestling's supposed to be? Like, yeah. Like, it, it, that's the whole thing about Orange Cassidy, right? Orange Cassidy is brilliant. I love Orange because Cassidy. Orange Cassidy is just, he's like the anti wrestler. It's like Curryman, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know who Curryman is? 
yeah it's brilliant <laughs> you know it's it, it, it's just funny it's like uh shoot I forget, I forget the the japanese comedic wrestler who wears the mask with like the big ears and he's great like uh there's been a couple i mean i don't think he was a comedic he, he did a lot of stuff but jushin liger or jushin liger is one of them um but, but jushin is an amazing wrestler yeah um, he is I think like kumito or, or kuku i forget his I name haven't, i haven't been in touch with the japanese scene for a while the, the guy wrestles a lot but but that's what wrestling is right and yeah then obviously you know brian kendrick is just a fantastic wrestler i mean him with Paul London as the SmackDown tag team champs. And, and he was interim WWE champ for a minute, too. What would what, 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 you say? Brian Kendrick was interim WWE champion for a minute, too, for a hot minute during this hot swap, like, rumble match they had, I remember. <laughs> he held the belt and was crowned champion for one minute. That's kind of funny. That's that's hilarious. <laughs> um, but, but, but even then he went to Impact, and I thought he was brilliant with his interactions with Eric Bischoff. Yes. Um, in Impact as Spanky. And then, <laughs> I mean, I could say Spanky, right? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. I just, it still makes me laugh. <laughs> it's just, it's just, this is the mind of Brian Kendrick because he's, he was trained by, you know, William Regal and Shawn Michaels and all these. He was trained in the same class as Brian Danielson, but he just loves the, the outlandishness that's, that wrestling can offer because wrestling doesn't have to be this straight faced, you know, presenting this as kayfabe, but there can be comedy, there can be drama, there can be different genres of it, just like you see different genres of movies. So, yeah, I he's got a he's got a really crazy mind for this kind of. And then, humor. And then it's, it's I, very, it's very like Adult Swim. I see his kind of mind as like the kind of mind would be behind the shows of Adult Swim. <laughs> and then I enjoyed his run as cruiserweight too. Mm -hmm. I, thought, I thought that was him at its best. I really that did. was really, really cool because I was training with him at that time. And I was actually training with him before he got the call to go back to WWE for the Cruiserweight Classic. And then sure enough, after training wrapped up, he went back and got to see him employ all these things he's been teaching us and then pull out a fucking burning hammer on Kota Ibushi in the middle of the tournament. So the one and only time we'll ever see a burning hammer in WWE ground. And what what is that like? Because obviously, one of the things is that, as you said, I think voice acting and wrestling and comics and all this stuff in cosplay, obviously, is all mixed up. Mm -hmm. And they're all cousins or they're second cousins removed, something <laughs> of that nature. Wait, yeah. wait, wait, I mean, I think I think some things are closer than others, right? right. So in this, D&D, &D, Dungeons and Dragons, is very close to certain aspects of anime, but I don't think that it's, I, I think it's like a step or two removed. It's not like right next to it. Um, yeah. But what is this like for you? Because obviously what you're learning on a physical level, I don't think that you're going to be suplexing somebody in a booth anytime soon. But not, I think- well, Not anytime soon, but I'm not going to count it out. <laughs> but, but I think some of the promo stuff that I would imagine that was training is utilized and also gives you perspective and also even, and I don't know how much they, they teach you about the business wrestling per se, but even that I think also gives you some inclination because my understanding of voice acting is that, and same thing with wrestlers is that a lot of the time you're an independent contractor. Yes. Yeah. And that's where the business really crosses over is because in both wrestling and voiceover, you have to know your brand that sets yourself apart you have to be very confident with your brand and and you are the one you're the brand owner you are the product the marketer the entrepreneur your human resources you're everything for this brand that is you and it's a lot of the same things you know trying to put yourself out there get the right connections make sure you know you're taking care of yourself and 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 uh, not short selling yourself, but also making sure you're keeping yourself available to work and being ready for whenever the opportunity strikes, not just waiting for the opportunity, but constantly preparing for that opportunity to come. Um, so I see a lot of the crossover in that both voiceover and wrestling when it comes to the business side of things. And when it comes to the presentation, again, I see it as the same entertainment value. You get these big feuds and rivalries that are built up over time for this giant climactic payoff that is told 
both through words and promos, but mostly in the ring through action. Like they're telling a story with their bodies and getting the audience invested through these subtle psychological techniques in, and and awareness of like, okay, the audience is dying, so let's pick it up or let's uh, give them some hope. Or they're they're really masters of this improvisational uh, structure, this story structure that they go in and again, it's it's not like, you know, everybody says, oh, wrestling's fake. It's like, yeah, well, so's a magic show. So's Game of Thrones. So's, you know, what is that? Why does it make it any less entertaining? In fact, knowing it's fake is actually more entertaining for me because I get to appreciate what they're putting together, this choreography stunt show, essentially. And, and you know, making it so it's it's engaging for an audience and, and got these high spots that, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to, be one to say everything needs high spots because it's getting a little dangerous nowadays. <laughs> I mean, I mean, so I, I forget it was uh, Malachi Black versus mm -hmm. Davey Richards. Yes, I, I, for on IWTV, and, and it was at like one in the morning. It was it was insane, and it was like chain wrestling for like fifteen minutes straight between the two of them, and the crowd was just going ballistic. It yeah. was amazing. There was like no high spots in that entire match. And yeah. it was crazy. You can tell a great story with just the basics. You just got to tell the story. You can't just be in there wanting to do the moves. You got to make them connect and really kind of. It, it was it was beyond. It was like one of the greatest matches I've ever seen. <laughs> I'll also, look at that one out. Yeah, I heard about that one. I got to I still have to watch it, it. That entire show was crazy. You had, I think, Alex Shelley with um, uh, um, uh, Tom, filthy Tom lawyer, Lawler, and you had Dalton Castle. Was with the oh, three of them yeah. in a match together, and that was crazy. Oh, <laughs> and, and, and 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 then the way Alex Shelley was just baiting all of them, <laughs> and he was like, "Hey, to talk about it, he filthy." That's that's the gloriousness of it. I love being a heel. I love being a face. It's whether I'm cheered or booed, getting an, a reaction for the audience is just so invigorating. Just I missed that live. Again, I did theater throughout high school and college, so that live performance aspect is what I really missed when I started going into wrestling. I was just doing voiceover work. I'm like, I need to get my body out there and just like do something with it. And and, and isn't it crazy how, how that all happens, right? Yeah. Yeah, I never thought that I would have fallen. I, I never thought I would have done this. I, I always wanted to as a kid. I loved wrestling. I never thought that I would just someday be like, fuck it. Fuck it, where are my boots? I'm getting in the ring. So 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 to, to even go into that, because obviously you're a voice actor and you're doing wrestling. And so how does that work for, for you? In which that I mean, because to me, you're hitting like two niches. And I'm curious, like for my you goal is to cross them over. What? My goal is to my goal is to cross over the niches, is to again, hashtag wrestling is anime, hashtag anime is wrestling, is to show both fandoms that there is something to love on the other side that they may not be aware of. And if I can bring myself to it, because right now I'm doing a very comedic character. For wrestling, pro wrestling, I wrestle as um, the sassy assassin, Sylvester Silverstein from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And he was tag team champions with his tag team partner, Sneaky Pete. We are the Sneaky Snakes. And now we have a third person who joined Sneaky Incorporated, Sacra Blue, the cat burglar. So this is kind of silly shit we do, but someday, someday you're going to see not the sassy assassin. You're not going to see, you know, some other name I come up with. You're going to see Eric Kimmerer in the ring. You're going to see the voice actor in the ring because that's the story I want to tell that I don't think has been told in wrestling yet. The anime voice actor showing that the he can make the ring his microphone and his body his voice that's and good. tell the story that way. So... Um, yeah, one someday I hope to go to Japan and be like the heel American voice actor. Just be like, I take all of your voices, I erase them, I make them my own. Oh, I, I got I got your tagline right here. <laughs> Slightly offensive. The voice of the gaijin. The voice of the gaijin. That might work. That might work. That, that, come on, tell me in, in Japan. That would work. That would be a huge, that would nuclear heat. I that would, would that would be so heel oriented. Oh man. I don't That's know. Like, I don't know if I would be, you know, bullet club contender for that, but I'd I <laughs> and, or, or better yet, better yet, after you pull that off, then you could be that 
I've renounced my Gaijin status, and now I'm the voice of the Bullet Club. And there you go. Yeah, <laughs> I, I got you. I got the entire thing uh, for you. That'd be a dream come true. But I, you know, again, I gotta, I gotta aim within my means. Right now, we're just trying to get wrestling, pro wrestling, to get a bit more of a following. We've got some plans for that. So, so obviously, you know, you got that going on, and, and SummerSlam is right around the corner. Mm-hmm. And so, I am curious. I got, I got a few wrestling questions. What okay. do you think is going on with Sasha? Because this is, and let me preface it, this, she is charging on the con scene for conventions 30K to make non-wrestling appearances at conventions as her guarantee, which I think she's partially worth it. I also think that it's a little pricey. I mean, it, that's not per autograph. Um, right. That That's a guarantee. Actually, you know, for, yeah. for the guarantee for the con. And uh, if you don't know how the guarantee works, that basically means that every autograph she sells counts against her guarantee. So if she yeah. sells 40K, she makes 40K. If she only sells 20, the con makes up the rest of 10K. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm fully aware of how I, I'm explaining it to my audience. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Um, but no, yeah, yeah. Uh, that is a pretty high guarantee. But again, I think if anybody were to clear 30K, she would be it. She's got that star power. She's got that, uh, so, that appeal. I don't have a problem with that. I think that, that, that no. I think she'll clear it. I don't know how further much she'll clear it over. Um, given given the, the state of the economy and a variety of other issues, yeah, yeah, and also the fact that there's 15 other people at a con, and you go to a con, and there's only so much money, and yeah. I don't know if she's gonna clear it, and but I'm also a capitalist, so if she pulls in 50, I'm rooting for her. Is my point. But do you think that she's going to AEW, or do you think that this is all just her taking a break from wrestling and she's gonna go back to WWE, or do you think that She's going to say, hey, maybe I want to take a few years off and maybe have a kid. Because, I mean, you know, it's a, it, it, and I'm not trying to, like, say she should do any of those three things. If she doesn't want to, or she says, maybe I'm done with wrestling. I don't know. Yeah. I'm curious what you think. I uh, I honestly have no thoughts on this other than, like, I mean, I don't know, Sasha. So whatever happens and whatever's happening only she knows the absolute truth and i can't really pretend to speculate on things there was one thing that happened when early on in my uh training you know i i read a bunch of dirt sheets and kept up with a lot of the wrestling news and the wrestling rumors and stuff like that and i brought one of the questions to my coach i was like hey do you think this is happening and his words to me were like don't be a fucking mark don't read the dirt sheets and ever since then i was like okay fine and so i don't trust anything that's going on unless it's confirmed from the horse's mouth and there's been so much speculation and rumors about and like backtracking of what the status is with sasha so i can't pretend yeah, to know. I, mean, I don't know this i don't know the story of what happened i don't know the story of i don't know how the, the fucking thing operates or what their contracts are like um i can hope I would see her in AEW because I'm much more of a fan of the AEW product and I'm a fan of hers and I want to see. I mean, I'll be very honest where I want to see her and I think she'll do better in Impact. I think Impact, Impact would be good. wrestling has somebody like Masha Slamovich. Come on, Masha versus Sasha. Yeah. <laughs> Masha versus Havoc. You know, you know, you know, no, no, no Sasha versus, versus Havoc. Um, Rosemary, Taya Valkyrie versus Sasha Banks. Come on. There would be some great matchups in there. That's a ma- yeah. That's all I'm gonna say. That's what I want. I do want to see Sasha versus Jade Cargill, though. I think that'd be a great match. Who who who? Sasha versus Jade Cargill in AEW. That could be interesting. There could be a lot of good stuff that that, that happens. Yeah. Um, in that you know, but 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 I, I digress. And I am curious about SummerSlam, Roman or Brock or Theory. I'm going to go Roman. I'm just going to go Roman. I mean, that seems to be what this whole thing has been built on. Um, I mean, I mean, obviously, they haven't built anybody to dethrone him. So the only person that can dethrone him is Brock. So I still think that there's a, pro- there's a chance for that. But if they're building this as the last match between them, then if Brock wins, there's obviously going to have to be a rematch. So it's... It's a mess of so so. Where, where do you think Austin Theory fits into all this? I 
I don't know because again, I haven't been watching a lot of WWE, so I'm not. I mean, really he, sold he, on his he obviously he's Mr. Money in the Bank. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know his whole shtick, and I know his whole. Uh, you know, he's Mr. McMahon's chosen one. You know, the the second coming of John Cena, essentially. Um, I just don't know exactly if what what I was talking about with one of my coaches, with my assistant coach Brandon. Um, with Brian's consistent coach, Brandon. Uh, we're talking about how they kind of hot shot the whole Liv Tyler money in the bank thing on Ronda and didn't really have a lot of story to it. Um, it was just kind of a real hot shot. They didn't really build up to her cashing in. So that's something we would have liked to have seen. With Theory, I don't know. Again, I haven't been watching the past couple of weeks, so I don't know what his story is with the money in the bank, how he's been presenting himself as it, if he's issued any challenges or threats or any kind of chase. Um, but I, I, my sincerest hope is they do not try to replay the Seth Rollins shtick. That they do not try to replay that. They do not try to redo the heist of the century from that WrestleMania when Seth Rollins comes in and makes it a triple threat and wins. I really hope they don't, they're smart enough not to do the exact same thing twice. Yeah. I, I don't know what they're going to do. I, I think that it could make some sense for him to cash in, but I also yeah. think that, you know what it is? I think that it'd be fun if he just teased Roman for, for, for a good six months. And yeah. Just, 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 Again, build the story on it. Build the build the anticipation of when they're going to cash in, rather than hot shot it, hot swap the, the title. I, I would love it if he just pokes and he comes out in the middle of the match, and then he goes back when like Brock's at eight, and then Brock gets up and he just goes back to the back. Or he comes <laughs> up commentary. Come on, if he's doing commentary and then he's that thinking about doing he doesn't, that'd be great. It'd be so good. That'd be it'd, new. That'd be new. That'd be a new present, a new way to do it. It, it, but but he doesn't cash in. He's just teasing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but still, like, just to have that. I don't think I've seen that before with a Mr. Money in the Bank where they're on commentary holding the briefcase, like, leaning in and leaning back and kind of doing this whole, do I? Do I not? Do and I? He takes off and he's going to hand and he said, no, not right now. Yeah, and yeah. Um, and he goes right to the reference. You know, it's forgetting and then he goes to the back and then he comes back out. Like, <laughs> I think that would be brilliant. I think if they did that, that would be brilliant. And then, and then Vince McMahon might come out. Oh, it'd be brilliant. And then he's like, should you do it? Oh, it'd be so, it'd be so much fun to do it. But, but I digress. Um, <laughs> these, these, I mean, we're going to find out what's going to happen, but, but there has to be yeah. some teasing that has to happen. There has yeah. to be is, is, is all I want. And then, cause I love Austin theory as, as a teaser. And I think that guy is just funny and he knows how to poke a bear. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but we, we can only, want nice things and i don't know what's gonna happen with Liv, but i hope Liv beats ronda that's what i hope for i hope so too i think it's her time i i i have a nice you know Liv morgan refractor tom finest card that i bought for like 50 cents it's worth like six bucks on ebay i'm very happy with my investment <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> but, but, but i digress uh, on that front um and obviously i do want to talk about a few things where more and i'm gonna give you a chance to self-promote so we've been talking for a while um, I am curious where you see anime cons going because obviously we've gone through the entire COVID era and there has been a shift in things and things are coming back, but also things have evolved in, in a lot of ways where there's a lot of virtual meet and greets now. There's a lot of platforms where if I want a print of something or I want a Pop Funko or something signed, there are many ways how to get it. And also yeah. there's a lot of ways how to get it that are legit. Where, yes. and, and, and I say this because I'm a collector and I also resell things and these things have value. And so how do you feel about all this stuff? Because, you know, it's cool to go to a con, but also sometimes I just want an autograph of a character on their Pop Funko. And I, you're in California, I'm in Connecticut. No yeah. offense, the likelihood of you and me meeting is slimmer than me meeting somebody who is closer to where I'm at. Right, exactly. Um, unless you're coming, unless you tour the country, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I, don't I know. mean, I'm 
I'm always down for any con. So any kind of con invites me, I'm there in a heartbeat. I love the environment of cons. I went to them before I was a, a voice actor. And I remember being on the other side of the table and it was much more than just getting the autograph. It was the experience of like meeting the person that really meant a lot to me. And I don't think that feeling is going away anytime soon. I think there's still a lot of people that look, look for that experience, a chance to really like have a one-on-one -on -one interaction. Um, and yeah, we do have a lot of these other platforms for autographs and virtual meet and greets, um, but it's so uh, controlled. And again, I just I just love the environment, the 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 energy of people at a convention. So I don't think that's bound to go anywhere anytime soon. I think yeah, the, those that it does matter just to get the autograph, they have those avenues now, and and I'm really happy that they have those opportunities rather than having to do something they really wouldn't care about, like going out in public in a crowded area. Um, if that wasn't something up there, they were suited for. Even for me, it's just the idea that if I want, you know, an autograph, Aaron Yeager, you know, yeah. Funko, you know, Bryce is in California. It has nothing yeah. to die with a con on the East coast. I'm not yeah. going to San Diego Comic Con. <laughs> exactly. Because it, it's just, it doesn't make any economic sense. But Kineticon yeah. was last week. Or so, you know, I didn't go to Kineticon right now because I'm just super busy on my own personal life. But the idea is that that's 35 miles away. That, that, right. they, yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. There's a big difference between me traveling 35 miles and 3,000. <laughs> yeah. But again, like, if there is anybody that you would like to see, I always say this to anybody, and this is a general you to anybody watching. If there's anybody you would like to meet, it's uh, it never hurts to go to your local convention's website and send an email to their guest relations, sending just a, a simple, humble request saying, hey, you know, I'd like to for you to consider inviting this person out. Because uh, again, I, I love doing conventions. I will go anytime I'm invited anywhere i love traveling i love meeting people uh, i love meeting fellow fans of anime because i'm i'm not you know again i was on the other side of the table at one point the autograph table and i still consider myself there in a lot of respects i'm i mean when i'm there signing to me that's part of the job but then i get to have the fun which is the fun that everybody else there is having because I'm, I'm i'm just a weeb myself <laughs> And then, then obviously, there's a million other things I could ask you. Obviously, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think Brock's gonna win, but, but, but we can't be friends anymore. But that's okay. Um, <laughs> all, all jokes aside, um, obviously, you've been speaking for a while, so I do want to give you a chance to promote yourself. So, where can people bother you? Where could people hit you up? Where could people find you? Follow you on social media? Know where you're going to a con? Where can people, you know? recommend and what what kinds do you want to be recommended to or is everything fair game per se when they reach out to their local you know say hey i want to see eric kimmer at this con and all that fun stuff and all that stuff and what can people pick up prints and other things because not everybody is you can't go to every con yeah yeah people really do appreciate a lot of you know swag for lack of a better word yeah um well for prints and everything um you can go to streamily or color world uh books i believe color world books and both of them have shops set up i still am expanding on them and my streamily i think i need to re-establish re but i've got prints for sale on them all autographed um even on color world books you can book a five minute ten minute or so hangout uh one-on-one -on -one that we can do over Streamyard or or what have you um you can follow me on instagram and twitter at e kimmerer e-k-i-m-e-r-e-r -E 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 just my first initial and last name and i also stream pretty regularly on twitch um pretty much right now my schedules are mondays wednesdays and saturdays in the evenings um and i'm streaming a bunch of games like destiny 2 uh I've been going through the Yakuza games and my girlfriend and I are about to start up Final Fantasy 14 because we are hugely deep into that game. Um, <laughs> there's no escape. We're trapped. We're trapped in Aorzea. Um, but yeah, you can uh, follow me on those sites. Um, like I said, Streamly is a good place to get some prints. And as far as any conventions, I'm, I'm game for anything. Again, I love traveling. I love going to 
to different states. I haven't been out of the country for convention yet. I'd love to do that. So anybody in Australia, London, maybe <laughs> Ireland, if you guys want to recommend me, <laughs> but any convention I've been a lot across the East coast from, from Georgia to, to New York. Um, I've been to Colorado here in, in the West side. I've been, to Sakura Khan, my home state. I would love to go back there at some point, but just any convention, if you guys want to see me, meet me, uh, please put in a recommendation. I hope they will consider me and I hope I get a chance to meet you guys because this, this is everything I've wanted to do ever since I would first step foot in a convention myself. Just uh, trying to make my younger self as jealous as possible. Yeah, and I'm just gonna say this, um, you have to support indie content creators and voice actors and actresses are indie content creators. Um, and the way you do that is in a bunch of ways. Um, obviously, if they have shops, if they're selling friends, hangouts, you know, if they have buy me a coffees, if they have things on Twitch, you know, obviously throwing them a few monies, shekels, dollars, it goes a long way. Um, yeah, but I mean, aside from the monetary side of things, you know, the best way I think you can just support me is just uh, engaging, interacting, just uh, reach out to me on Twitch or Instagram or Twitter and just say hi. If you got any questions, that's even, always even the best going, way. Even going further, it, you know, and I've said this before about this show as well, is that honestly, I like likes. I like follows on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Bother me on TikTok. Bother him on TikTok. If you have a TikTok, or <laughs> I don't. I'm not. Twitter or a Snapchat or Twitch, and following because social media is free. And so, mm -hmm. obviously, Instagram matters, Facebook matters, you know, Twitch yep. matters. All that stuff matters. And following doesn't cost anything. And clicking the like button, the heart button, you know, the thumbs up button, leaving a comment said, "Hey, really enjoyed the stream." It goes a long way. You know, Absolutely. and I've been there and I'm sure you've been there where someone's like, hey, you know, I just had a really bad day. Heard your voice in this, man. Really made me feel better. You killed it in that animal. And, you know, yeah. I don't I appreciate when people throw me money for this show. And I appreciate <laughs> when people say, hey, you know, because, you know, it is at the end of the day to do this show. It, it's it's not cheap. But at the same time, I also appreciate when somebody says, hey, I really enjoyed that interview you did with that person. I grew up watching that person or I saw that person and they're in my favorite show. And that was a great interview, man. You know, cause it, it means something and it goes a long way. And, and you yeah. know, it's sometimes in life and it sounds weird, but money's great. But also when somebody just says, Hey, you did a killer interview. You know, I really appreciate that interview you did. You know, it goes a long way is all I'm going to say. It makes me feel special and it makes yeah, me feel like, Hey, people, actually appreciate what I'm doing. And that's the thing. I would imagine you feel the same way. When yeah, comes, that's your role. the support that matters to me is not again, anything monetary or anything like that. I mean, I, st I still I, I have to sell prints at conventions. And I still feel a little squingy about that. Because, you know, I'm, I'm happy to just sign anything, really, you know, I'm happy to make it a good, a good interaction for somebody because they they obviously came out here they already paid a bunch of money to come out here and do this i'm not the one who wants to be like oh give me more money for this experience i want to be able to provide that experience just but a lot of times i actually am forced to to sell um, it, it, it's it's very complicated and, and, and it's it, it's a tricky line even for me yeah. um you know you know not not to get too deep into it like i ran a kickstarter and we were speaking about it before and i'm very honest about it I don't want to have to run a Kickstarter and I don't want to have to raise money. I hate yeah. having to do that. And I wish somebody would say, Hey, you need a thousand bucks. I'll just give you a thousand bucks because I'm helping you out. And yeah. that's what you need for all your bills because I'm not looking to make millions of dollars doing this. I'm looking just to stay afloat and, and I'm looking to, to get my bills down by 40 to 50% where I don't mind having skin in the game. But my bills are about eight hundred dollars a year. So if I could get four hundred bucks, that means that I can find four hundred dollars elsewhere. But it just eases up tension and it allows stress to be relieved. And that's my whole thing in life. Yeah, um, because exactly. this is not my day job at all. Yeah. No, it's, 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 yeah. 
it's a process. It's it's a process getting there. Um, <laughs> but again, well, the best support that you can offer is just again engaging, just letting people know that you know they you liked hearing us if you want to hear us more in anime you know say that out because it really does matter to a lot of the clients they are scouring instagram and and twitter a lot of the casting directors are keeping an eye on you know who's being talked about and again i don't want to be like people should talk about me people should tell me how great i know i'm just saying you know if you did like what i did and you do want to see me in more if those two criteria match up, then that's probably the best way you can help. Yeah, and 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 I'm gonna just quickly promote myself. Obviously, you know, all my social media is Pop Anime Comics um, on Twitter, Pop Anime Comics on Instagram, Pop Anime Comics on Facebook. I got a lot of content, everybody. You know, I got almost 500 interviews in in like three years on on Facebook. Um, so I got a lot of content every day during the week through Monday through Friday at 12. Um, PM on YouTube, I release an interview from earlier this year. And so obviously that cycled out. Um, I have like another 50 before I get to you that I have to release. So, wow. so it, it, your, your interview is going to be shot out and I re shot out in October, more or less, possibly. Um, okay. But, but obviously I appreciate people checking out all my content, subscribing on YouTube. It's Pop Anime Comics. Um, this show and my other show, Pop Anime Comics Lounge, are fusing together. Um, I'm trying to point to the the name. Yeah, Pop Anime Pop Comics. There it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's down below, everybody. It's down below. <laughs> I didn't know what you were doing. I was a little concerned. I was, I was, I was like, I was like, where, where, where am I pointing? Which I'm, I'm mirrored right now, so I don't have it, like, it's just orientation. Down. It's just yeah, down. <laughs> down. Yeah. Um, Over. But, but and, and right. obviously, I have buy me a coffee if you want to support this show. If you want <laughs> advertising services like live reads if you want to buy the back banner that's for sale uh that's my friend's comic um he didn't pay me i just like his book and i want it to win because it's an awesome book it's like robotech just better um <laughs> and those those are covers Quite that are actually not out yet so that's a first appearance um but if somebody wants to buy that we could talk about it if you want advertising services we could talk about it more than happy um if you want to pretty much sell anything you want to sell on my show you can talk about it all that fun stuff i'm open to selling everything and anything um i have an ebay store you can check that out pop out of my comics collectibles and october 5th um my full class of comic book investing the fundamentals is being released and i am starting a locals channel um that is behind a paywall along with a sub stack to actually release the entire class before it's fully out on udemy in pieces that's a cheaper option so if you want to learn how to buy and sell comics, um, you can take my class and I'll have more information on all of that. Um, again, I'm just giving you the option of Substack or Locals, depending on how you want to pay. They're going to be the same price. So, um, uh, yeah, there, there you go. They are going to be behind a paywall. Um, I am eyeing it, I think, around five bucks, maybe seven dollars. So a month on those two platforms and I'm eyeing it about 50 bucks on Udemy. Um, it is cheaper, but you're paying more upfront. And also moving forward, I'm building out substantial classes that will always be out first on Locals and Substack um, before they get over to Udemy. So along with bonus articles and some other content. So that's my area of expertise and I like making money with comics. So- Busy, busy, busy. It, 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 I, this is how it's not even, it's my, it's like my other side job. Um, <laughs> yeah, hey, I like money. What can I say? But yeah. enough well, of that. Side jobs also just one last plug. Watch wrestling pro wrestling on Twitch. You guys can catch it at twitch.tv slash wrestling PW. And our next show is going to be August 27th in Burbank, California at the Burbank Moose Lodge, which will be airing on Twitch the following Thursday. So keep an eye out for the sassy assassin, his partner, sneaky Pete and sacre blue and maybe the sneaky snakes will make an appearance and then and then and then i'm just going to give you the final word <laughs> well thank you thank you very much for having me on this one thank you for giving me a chance to tell all these stories i'm i'm always always ecstatic to be able to give a little a little peek behind the scenes of things because it's also fascinating to me it's also 
like I always love peeking behind the curtain and with the accessibility we have nowadays of the internet and all the YouTube shows and interviews we have, a lot more people are becoming aware of what is going on and kind of getting inspired themselves to do to go into it. So I'm I'm just gonna end this by saying if you guys want to become voice actors, I wish all the power to you and all the support to you. If there's a will, there's a way. And I guarantee, don't think about, well, my voice, is it suited? No, there's a place for you in this industry, as long as you're willing to put in the work and and uh, make the right moves, there's a place for you. So just one last thing I always love to end on. Um, well, couple, two last things I love to end on. Number one, love the art in yourself and not yourself in the art. So don't go chasing fame. Don't go chasing, I need to be an anime. Love, if you want to be a voice actor or an actor or an artist of any kind, love that it's the art in you that you want to bring out. And finally, I always say this at the end of my streams because I am a huge wrestling nerd. Take care, be well, and as always, stay too sweet. And that, everybody, is a wrap.